So today we'll talk about fluorescence, and fluorescence is absorption followed by emission. And we care about fluorescence because it's a, path <clears throat> a pathway towards making spatially resolved measurements. So I like to talk a lot more about the absorption. It's simpler, I think, to understand. But I'm going to try to introduce the theory of uh, fluorescence. And it turns out that if you, if you keep it simple, it's really pretty easy to follow. So I'll uh, give you a bit of a background, talk about experimental setups, uh, signal levels. And then there's something called the two-level model. So the way we think about how we model for us, even though molecules have many atoms and molecules have many levels, you can actually interpret this with a simple two-level model because in the end, we're usually exciting between uh, one, what, two specific states to start the process. And then I like to talk about characteristic times and then how we think about extending the two-level model to be uh, relevant to uh, real molecules. So the sketch on the right is how I think about this. Uh, we have uh, two quantum states that are uh, connected, allowed, and we pick those by looking at the absorption spectrum. So we calculate the absorption spectrum, think about what the fluorescent spectrum will be, and then pick the wavelengths for excitation. And those two states are one and two, and once the molecule or atom is in level two, it may, because this is a delayed process, it may then emit from some other quantum state that's nearby. So because of collisions, molecules will easily move between these upper states. Since the collision frequency is of the order of 10 to the ninth per second, and the delay time, the A coefficient, might be 10 to the seventh, there's usually time for a lot of collisions before the emission takes place. Therefore, it may come from different upper states. Now it can come down to all of the allowed transitions. So the fluorescent spectrum will be different than the absorption line or a pair that you've actually used. Okay, so it's uh, laser-induced fluorescence. So when, a when we see chemiluminescence from a flame, that is spontaneous emission. But we're going to drive it by exciting these states with lasers. So it's called laser-induced fluorescence. Multi-step process, uh, one to two, possible collisional changes, and then the light comes back out from any of those upper states. Therefore, the fluorescent, spe the fluorescent spectrum is much broader than the exciting transition. And usually what you want, because of all of these signals are, can be weak, you want to capture that fluorescence at a wavelength different than the laser. So you can avoid the scattering that inevitably gets into your detection system from the laser wavelength. So that's a plus. You can have, you can, you can shift the collection bandwidth away from the laser. So the main thing is to recognize it comes from multiple states. It's not instantaneous, although it's fast. Sometimes it's not fast enough. So I know we have, we've had experiments where maybe it, it takes a few hundred micros, uh, nanoseconds before the uh, uh, fluorescence is collected. And if it's a high-speed flow, there's been some motion. And if you're doing planar laser-induced fluorescence, that means that it may have moved away from one pixel imaging that flow field. So sometimes the decay time is a factor. Why do we care about it? Well, it's because it will allow us to make spatially resolved measurements, which are important to in many, in many studies. You know, you design, you have an experiment, and you either then design the diagnostic to fit the experiment, or you have a diagnostic, and then you design it design things so that you get a good result. But a desired result in many flow field problems, turbulence problems, is to make a measurement at a point. So we do that in a simple way to think about this is you have a, a laser beam which is focused. And it's not actually focused to a point, it's focused to a waste. But if it's focused to a waste and then you collect the light at right angles onto a detector, so the light that you're collecting comes from this little region which we'll call a point, which is, uh, has some sort of effective length and, uh, and, and width. It might be of the order of a cubic millimeter. It could be smaller. It might be bigger. Of course, if you make it smaller and smaller, there's fewer and fewer molecules to produce a signal. So there's a limit as to what you can do in terms of just getting enough signal to make a measurement. But it depends a little bit on the size of the experiment that you're trying to, to work with. But think of it as something like a cubic millimeter or so of that range. The light is collected by a, a lens, typically. Uh, it can be a mirror, but a lens. 
and we frequently talk about the, uh, the solid angle of collection or the F number of the lens. So the fluorescent signal, which comes from that region, goes into four pi stair radians, and you're only going to collect a fraction of that light, and that's going to be determined by omega, the solid angle. So you need that solid angle to be big which gets harder and harder as the experiment gets bigger and bigger. So one of the problems with fluorescence is that it's, it's, harder, it's harder to apply in a very big experiment. It's easier in a small experiment. And then that light goes on to some sort of a detector, which might be a photomultiplier if you were doing single point LIF uh, versus uh, multi-point PLIF. So the motivation then is to get spatial resolution. And if you want to think about this in the context of uh, a spectral, a, a, a wavelength tuned experiment. We talk about that for scan direct absorption. Now think about this for fluorescence. As we scan across the absorption line here, this would be the lambda excite. Scan across, if we were to scan across an absorp uh, absorption line, then we would produce some sort of a fluorescence signal. It might not be at that same wavelength, but it would be on about the same time scale. However, most fluorescence experiments are done with a pulse laser not a spectrally narrow laser. But I, I like to think about it in the way of a spectral resolved experiment. So I actually work hard on something called spectrally resolved fluorescence using narrow line with lasers so we can retain the line shape information. Almost all people who do uh, uh, PLIF do it with a pulse laser, which removes all the information on the, on the uh, line shape, unfortunately. Okay, it can be species specific in the sense that we, if we could pick windows of excitation so that the ex exciting wavelength excites only that given species. It's much stronger than Raman, but of course it's going to be a lot weaker than looking at a path integrated absorption signal. So in the path integrated absorption signal, we absorb some large number of photons. Now if we look all along maybe 1% of that path length, well, we only have 1% of those photons to work with. And they're collected going to four pi star radians, and we're going to collect maybe 1%. So it looks like that's the trouble. But it turns out that it's not always trouble. Why? Because we can get lasers with a large number of photons. So it can be, over time, people have learned how to uh, use uh, fluorescence for measuring a lot of different properties. Uh, chemists are probably usually interested in just measuring a species. Gas dynamics people might want to measure <clears throat> temperature, uh, pressure, line broadening maybe, velocity. You can do velocity with the lift. And, uh, or maybe the number density in a specific state. Over time, a lot of different species have been measured. This is a very incomplete list. These are some of the more important ones that have been, uh, the earliest work with PLF was done with, uh, with uh, OH. Uh, NO has been done quite a bit. CO is hard to do. Usually it's done by two photons. So absorption is a linear process. Uh, fluorescence is uh, typically a linear process, meaning the signal is proportional to the incident light. But sometimes you can't access the wavelengths you need. So for example, carbon monoxide doesn't absorb in a convenient wavelength, so it's excited with a two photon process. That means it's nonlinear. That means the signal depends on the product of the uh, uh, intensity squared. When you have a nonlinear process, you have to be very careful about how you calculate that signal. But it's a way to get carbon monoxide, iodine, very popular. A lot of different polyatomics. Um, acetone, which was pioneered in my laboratory. I didn't discover acetone. We discovered the use of acetone for fluorescence. Biacetyl, toluene, a lot of other species. So there's a lot of possibilities and many atoms. In fact, the earliest work with, with LAF was done with atoms. The chemists got interested in lasers, thought of it as a sensitive way to detect atomic constituents, impurities. Um, I know there were some famous people who would measure, say, arsenic or, or toxic things in uh, in, uh, present in low concentrations using laser-induced fluorescence. So a lot of early work was done with atoms. Uh, so the process is uh, laser absorption followed by collisional change, followed by emission. So it's not instantaneous, but it, 
and, and it can be very fast, what's it going to depend upon? It's going to depend upon A, the Einstein A coefficient, in the absence of any collisions. So if we're in any collisions, it would just decay by at a rate of A. And remember, A is always related to the oscillator strength. So if A is 10 to the 6th and there were no collisions, then the, the signal would decay in about 10 to the 6th, 10 minus 6 seconds. Uh, if you, so you can decide to yourself if that's fast or slow. It depends on what you're studying. But certainly in hypersonic flows, it's not necessarily fast enough. And so there's tricks we have to play sometimes to make the signal decay faster. Um, you can use either CW or pulse lasers. Virtually everyone uses pulse lasers. Virtually everyone but Stanford. But there's some, be there's some benefits of CW if you, if you can make it work because we can get to spectrally resolve. And we, we work on this all the time. But the pulse lasers have so many more photons that you can generate signals, uh, and therefore you can spread the light out over a sheet and do planar laser do fluorescence. I'd like to go through the history for you, just a little bit of the history. Um, in the early days, you know, most of these things would require some sort of tunability of the laser. Remember, the lasers were first developed. They were kind of fixed frequency, um, uh, solid-state lasers. People were learning about the physics of lasers. It was some time before there was a, a, a way to tune the wavelength of the laser uh, uh, continuously. And uh, so in the laser, there's a pump source of some, so something in, provides energy to the lasing medium, and then the lasing medium will emit light. So it can be a very inefficient overall process. And to get tunability, what was done in the early days, a flash lamp of light was used to excite a dye, an organic dye. The, the energy goes in, and it's usually spectrally broad, Energy goes in, excites the dye, the dye fluoresces over a wide wavelength range. And then somehow you put the, this in a cavity and you restrict the laser emission to a narrow region and you tune this with optical elements inside the cavity. And the person who I think did this first was Fritz Schaefer in Germany. So it's an evolution of, uh, there was a clear need and uh, it was first done. And these would be very slow Maybe the flash lamp would be one hertz or maybe slower. Uh, a little bit later, uh, that would have been a, a, a pulse system, pulse, flash lamp pulse. A little bit later, uh, there was a first tunable CW dye laser. So it's still a dye laser. So the dye is the thing that gives you the, the emission over a wide range from which you then pick wavelengths using an optical cavity. And if you want to work in a different region, you typically use another dye. So there's hundreds of dyes that you can choose from to make sure you fluoresce at the right place. So tunable CW, so that was uh, important. And then around 1980, there was the ability to convert that, which was typically in the visible, to convert that into the uh, ultraviolet. So that was CW double. So that was a CW laser, meaning you're pumping typically with an argon ion laser, argon ion laser. This is, these are things that consume kilowatts of power out to get a few watts of power out, which would go into the dye in the cavity, and then you would filter down with optical components to get the emission where you want it. Uh, but it was finally it was done with a continuous source and with enough intensity in a cavity to, uh, to do frequency doubling. That was around 1980. I had one of the very first ones. Then uh, uh, there was a big explosion in, in light sources, neodymium and YAG, which persists to this day as a very standard, powerful method for pumping, neodymium and YAG lasers. YAG stands for yttrium aluminum garnet. And excimers are another, uh, you may remember I showed you some repulsive potential wells, potential uh, curves for if when atoms come together and they don't like each other, they come together and go back away. There's no stable well. Uh, and that's the essence of what's needed to have an excimer, like argon fluoride, fluoride, xenon chloride, xenon fluoride. Those are certain combinations, and they're very popular. They're very kind of turnkey, box, turn it on, out comes light, a single color. They're fixed, fixed wavelength. And then 
uh, we learned in, around, in the early 1980s, had a really good student, his name was Ed Ray. He learned how to take our dye laser and, and rapidly modulate it. The commercial ones would tune very slowly, tune wavelength slowly. We learned how to do that very fast. And to this day, uh, nobody has a laser that scans faster than that mechanical version that my student produced. However, it was a dye laser, and dyes are messy and unpopular now. So we now use uh, solid state. 1981 or two was the first uh, planar laser induced fluorescence result. This was a single shot image of uh, the OH distribution in a, in a flame in a laboratory. Um, in those days, the camera, there, was, there was no intensified cameras. So we had the laser, we had the idea, um, we could produce the, the light. We form it into a sheet, send it into the flame, get some light back out. But we had to use single shot uh, homemade intensified camera. So there was something called a Reticon array, 100 by 100, only 10,000 pixels. Now there are a million pixels, uh, but we could make that work. Uh, but we had to make a, our homemade intensified camera. Of course, now you can buy these cameras that work at very high speeds, very high speeds off the shelf. So cameras have advanced a lot in the, in the last 40 years. This picture down here is one of my students' uh, works for a company called PSI in Boston. That was the first PLIF of, of a spray flame. So what's the problem with the spray flame? You're sending light in. Now in addition to you know, trying to measure, say, OH, but you also have a lot of scattering from the droplets. So you have to think about how is that going to contaminate your signal. So in the background, you see the OH distribution, and you see the scattered light from the, from the, uh, from the droplets. Small, small experiment. That was a challenge, but uh, overcame it with basically spectral filtering allows you to uh, separate out these interfering effects. So there's some highlights. Um, uh, so, so PLIF came to combustion in the early 80s. Um, a lot of stuff on OH was popular. NO was popular, became popular. Temperature is always important, so how do you get to temperature? Typically that was, uh, you'd have two flip systems or two lasers pumping two different quantum states. So it's a two-line absorption. You pump one, then pump the other. And then you get, um, if you think the fluorescent signal is proportional to the absorption, then you get temperature from fluorescence just by doing two-line absorption. And there were, we learned how to do that and also to get at uh, velocity. About 1990, um, um, there was interest in can we, well, at least at Stanford, what I can tell you is that um, my fluid mechanics friends were uh, uncomfortable with the complexity of PLIF and thinking about radical species like OH. These computational fluids people really wanted non-reacting flows. So we figured there was a way to study non-reacting flows with tracers. And uh, we actually started with something called biacetyl, which is a particular structure molecule, which is a kind of a flavor agent in popcorn. The liquid is messy, smells, and, uh, but it uh, absorbs light from uh, conveniently from uh, uh, XMR lasers. And, and they emitted into the visible, so we could use a visible camera. Unfortunately, after about uh, six months, we had a leak in the laboratory, and the smell of this stuff went out the exhaust, and the people next door complained it was causing cancer, and so we shut down. So my student from Spain, really good student, uh, did a survey, what are all the possibilities, and he came back with acetone, which is a ketone. So ketones are good structures for PLF imaging. Along about 1990, there became some interest in high-speed flows. There was a program called NASP, the National Aerospace Plane Program. A lot of interest in high-speed flows. Um, then there was some interest in getting, can we do this at high pressures? And then, uh, uh, anyone here from Cornell? Probably not. Okay. Um, you might ask the question, why, why do we do uh, laser-induced fluorescence with uh, uh, electronic transitions? Why don't we do it with red transitions? Hmm? Yes, exactly. So, so if you look, the A coefficient, I told, I told you the A coefficient for CO was 
30. And the A coefficient for, say, OH is 10 to the fifth. So the probability uh, per second of emitting a photon is so low with carbon monoxide that you think, well, you won't get any signal. But it turns out that that, was, uh, that wasn't quite right because it's actually not A, it's A over Q. The, we're going to get into this, the, the uh, uh, so-called quench rate. Anyway, it is possible to do PLF in the infrared, and we did some of it. It's got its downside, but it's possible. And then people became interested in uh, high sp uh, doing PLF faster, faster and faster and faster. And so people, a lot of them started here at Princeton, actually, built uh, pulse burst lasers so that you could have a, a rapid, a chain of maybe 100 pulses at high speed. And that's the essence now of pulse burst lasers that people can buy for half a million dollars or something. Uh, along the way, we did uh, found out that we could do CO2 in the UV. Uh, anyway, a lot, of, a lot of work on high speed. But I still like the CW concept as, as a way to, uh, to, get, to keep the, retain the spectrally resolved information. But it, it's, it's limited, very limited. So here's the basic idea again. Uh, we have a laser. Think of it as a single uh, uh, focus to a, a waste that size. Here's a solid angle. Here's D. Now, you have to think about this. Um, what are the variables here? You can pick the wavelength of light that you're using. Now, you have to decide how you're going to detect. And so there's some questions about what type of detector you use. You might use, a, if this is a single point experiment, you probably you would use a folder multiplier. And you probably would use a spectral filter. So there would be some scattered light here, and you want to reject the laser wavelength. So you would do a filter and, say, a single element detector. This could be a spectrometer. So in other words, you could collect this light onto a box, which has spectrally resolved the light, so that the light comes in and it appears at the exit plane spectrally resolved, which has some additional information. Of course, every time you split the light up, you have less signal. So the detector could be a PMT or it might be a, a, a grading monochromator to disperse the spectrum. So you put in a single color, but out comes multiple colors. And there's information content in that distribution. So there's, there's a lot of options. Uh, you might have a, you might look at the intensity that's emitted at a fixed narrow wavelength. Or you might use a spectrometer to look at the, so imagine a pulse of light goes in and a pulse of light comes out. You might just look at the intensity of that pulse at, uh, at a single color, or you might look at how it's distributed over wavelength with a spectrometer. And you get to pick where you're gonna pick a, use a filter if you're gonna use a filter. Now there's another, Another strategy which is used, especially if the flow field is kind of steady, is you actually scan the excitation wavelength. So rather than fix it, you might scan it. So that would be called an excitation spectrum. So maybe you collect, and uh, this is the sort of thing that Tom Hwili did for me. So we would scan the laser. You have a spectrometer collecting the spectrum. But you gradually scan the excitation laser. So you're mapping out the absorption spectrum mapping the absorption spectrum, but you're looking at the fluorescent spectrum as a function of the absorption. And uh, there's information content in that. That's common, but it's uh, a kind of a slow process, and therefore you're more likely to use it in a relatively steady flow. Now, sometimes there's an interest in measuring the temporal behavior. So now imagine a pulse laser, and now imagine that you measure the fluorescent signal with a fast detector. It would go up, and then it would decay. After the end of the, after the excitation goes away, the fluorescence goes away. But it decays at a different time scale. So your laser pulse, typical laser pulse, would be five nanoseconds. Although you can now get shorter pulse lasers for different reasons, femtosecond lasers. But if there's a pulse and it stops exciting, the fluorescence will build up to some sort of a peak and then it will decay. And that decay rate is set by uh, collisional phenomena. It turns out we need to know that 
rate in order to make fluorescence quantitative. So there are reasons why people will sometimes look at the time resolved signal to measure the collisional quench rate. We'll come to that later. So what's the typical uh, situation here? Um, you might have, say, a cubic millimeter or so space up here. Uh, it might vary between, say, maybe a few tenths of a, a millimeter up to maybe five. If you, you know, if you have a blip experiment, unless you say you have uh, thousand by thousand pixels, so you, you get to decide the size of the region you're going to image, and therefore the length of each uh, image volume. But you might want to have a resolution of a fraction of a millimeter, keeping in mind that if you you cannot image zero length. No, there's no photons there. The solid angle of collection, that, this is the limiting factor. So typically, we, we think about the solid angle with the lens area over this length squared. And you can rewrite this in terms of the F number if you're a camera person. So it's one over the F number. You want small F number, big solid angle. Keeping in mind that you probably, if it's any kind of a mod reasonable size experiment, you're never going to capture more than 1%. Omega over 4 pi is likely to be less than 1%. So you've got to send in a lot of photons to absorb enough photons, to emit enough photons, to collect enough photons to have success. And usually you win that game by having uh, good lenses uh, and high-power lasers. So, for example, if you have a, a, a small F number lens of two and a half, which is about as good as you can do typically, uh, that collected fraction is one percent. So, collection process is in, relatively inefficient, even for fast lenses. Okay, now, um, imagine we're exciting between levels one and two, and for now, let's just think about. Um, the, mo the molecule or atom only has those two, two levels. What is the amount of signal that we think we're getting out? These fluorescent signal, and let's imagine maybe it's a steady experiment. The fluorescent signal, or transitions between two and one, is the num number of molecules, I guess this would be, uh, okay, let's do this for you. This is the number of molecules in the observation volume in level two times the probability of emission per second, A, times omega over 4 pi. So it's pretty simple. The fluorescent signal is nothing more than the number of molecules that are up there. But how did they get there? Well, you had to put them there. So it's the number of molecules that are there, the probability of emission in a collection. Or I usually use lowercase for number density. So the number per unit volume times the volume. That's all it is. So it sounds simple. Or you can do this in terms of power. Power collected is just this divided by H nu. So if you set the experiment, only levels two and one, kind of simple. It looks simple. So the fluorescent signal in this case depends only on constants and the number density in two. Yeah, but what's N2? That's the problem. We want N1. We want the number density in level one, where all the molecules are. Number two, there's not many up there. Probably almost zero until you put them in. So that all the challenge is about getting number two and two. Um, if you want to think about this as a pulse experiment, you just have to kind of integrate this over time. So number of photons collected would be the number density in level two, as a function of time dt times these constants. So you can think about this CW or pulsed uh, it uh, same. Now you remember this uh, this diagram here, which we talked about uh, when we introduced the Einstein coefficients. Notice how we introduced the Einstein coefficients for just levels one and two, but all of a sudden we're talking about molecules with lots of levels. You just have to t think about what happens between any two uh, optically connected um, states. So the, uh, here's where the process starts. We have a, you've decided that you're going to excite at some wavelength lambda to take you from one to two. And uh, 
W now is the notation for the probability per second per unit intensity. So we're going back to the Einstein relation. So we have in, uh, absorption. This is induced emission, uh, collisional excitation, collisional de-excitation, and fluorescence. So these are the processes that can contribute to the signal if we have these two levels. They're all uh, probabilities, they're all numbers per second. So that would mean that the Q is a, has units of per second. So the rate of going from one to two by collisional excitation would be the number in one times this probability per second. That's an endothermic process that requires a lot of energy, and so frequently this one is neglected. So you're up here, if, if you were at uh, 300 nanometers, is four electron volts. So it better be really hot. One electron volt's like 10,000 Kelvin, 11, 11, 12,000 Kelvin. So it better be pretty hot in order for you to have collisional excitation. So uh, typically that process is negligible. However, this one is not. This is exothermic. So if you're up here, it doesn't take any energy in the collision to de-excite. That's called a quenching collision. That one is fast and is the, is the primary problem with quantifying fluorescence. Here's the signal we want right here. This is spontaneous emission. So the uh, number density in 2 times A is then the number of... Uh, of uh, molecules that are de-excited or the number of photons emitted. So this is just the Einstein theory. You remember he, he, Einstein did it in terms of this energy density, photon energy density thing that I replaced with <coughs> the laser intensity. So W is this rate per second of going from, from here to here. And if we want to do this at a fixed frequency, nu to nu plus d nu, we Remember, we had the Milne theory, which we neglected the, the details of the line shape. When we went to the real theory, we put in, we do this at each excitation frequency nu. And we still have the, the integral of the line shape function d nu is 1. All right, so that's basically we're using the stuff we did before. So here are the processes we have to think about. Most of the time, People use a pulse laser, and it's spectrally broad compared to the absorption line. So you can at least think about it. It may look something like this. That might be the intensity profile of the laser. Here's the absorption line with its shape, which might be width of an order of a tenth of a wave number. The uh, typical pulse laser will have a wave, uh, uh, a width of, a, say, half of a wave number. So you can at least imagine that there's a lot of the energy is outside of the absorption line, but that the intensity is kind of constant for simplicity. Assume that it's constant across this region where the absorption takes place. So if you make that assumption, that approximation, you can kind of simplify this a little bit. So the rate of going from 1 to 2 is the number in 1 times the B coefficient. And remember, there's A, B12, B21. I only need to know one of them to calculate all three. But B12 is the excitation one. So we take that B coefficient times the intensity, and that is this parameter uh, W. This is the, the combination. So that's the rate per second that individual molecules, W is the rate per second that the individual molecules go from one to two during this period during this uh, pulse period. And so you can integrate that over time if you want to. So now it's very common, uh, in both in uh, reaction chemistry and in uh, fluorescence calculations, to use uh, uh, rate equations. So you, you write the equation for the uh, differential production of two. It's the formation minus the removal. So the rate of change of the population density in level two at an instant in time is the number in one times the probability per second of going exciting minus the removal at that instant in time. So notice there's the A, of course, that's our signal actually, 
Q, that's the loss due to the collisional quenching, that does not produce a photon. And um, this is the induced emission. So when you have uh, intense enough light, you can no longer neglect this process. So anyway, you write the, the correct rate equation. Now we're doing, there's only two levels in this, pro in this problem right now. I haven't admitted possibility of other adjacent levels. I write the rate equation. You make what's called the steady state approximation, which is to say that the uh, this term is uh, is going to be small. This is make that assumption. It's not that it's zero; it's that it's small. So you set it equal to uh, that to zero, and you solve for the number density in two, and we call that the steady state solution. That does not mean that n two is constant. It only means that you solved it with this equation by setting this side to zero. So you solve for n two state. Remember what we're trying to do: the fluorescence signal comes from N2. What we care about is N1. But we've just solved for N2 in terms of N1. And the excitation parameter, the excitation parameter, collisional quenching, and the radiative loss term. So we have an answer. If we're interested in N1, we have an answer. Tell me these numbers, and I have the answer. Okay, so uh, that's the solution. You, there's, some, there's problems, but that's the solution. And that's called the, the uh, steady state solution to the two-level model. Now, somebody asked me about uh, um, distortion due to laser intensities. So actually, what we, we proceed now in uh, typically in two limits. You typically work in the weak exit, the linear regime. But sometimes, in fact, the Purdue people push for quite a while the, the saturated lift signal. I want to keep in mind this, these things that we had from the past that came to us from, from uh, as we introduced the equation, of, uh, developed the equation of radiative transfer. In the weak excitation limit, all we do is we look up, look up there and we say, well, this is weak. This is strong. This is weak. We basically just argue that this is uh, this term is smaller than these two. They're all units of per second. This one might be 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th. This one might be 10 to the 9th. So you begin to see the problem. And this one might be uh, some number. So as long as this one's smaller than these, I get rid of that term. And that's the common result. That's the common condition that we use. Now, for this very simple case that we're studying, which these molecules only have two levels, this is a two-level model, and since initially N2 is much less than N1, then we'll call N1 this initial value, and it's a constant. So you can solve for N2 in terms of what you're after, the number density in one before you did anything. And all we need now is this, this laser intensity dependent parameter, A and Q, and we know A. It's fixed. We don't know Q because it depends upon the collisions in that mixture. And that's the bugaboo of fluorescence. So if we go into weak, lex weak limit and go back and, and solve now for our fluorescent signal, where we now can insert for uh, N2, knowing, using the known volume. Now, you usually have to calibrate or measure the known volume. The known A, the known omega before pi, so introduce these terms. And if you want to think about this, this is uh, the way I think about it. The fluorescent signal in photons per second is the photons absorbed per second times the yield, which is the ratio of A over Q and the fraction collected. So it's, it's really photons in, fraction absorbed, fraction, fraction absorbed, fluorescent yield, Fraction collected. It's just a product of three terms. Sending more photons, you get more signal if you're in a linear regime. The trouble is we need to know A and we need to know Q21. And Q21 is dependent on the mixture and their uh, efficiencies in, collision, in uh, electronic de-excitation. So if you only want to know is there some trace species there 
for us, this is fine. If you want to find, interpret, get the number density of that species, now we've got a bit of a problem. You've got to calibrate it somehow, or you've got to calculate it. So fluorescence turns out to be kind of semi-quantitative for the most part. But some people would argue, I hate, I hate that darn Q term. What if we make W21 big? So that it no longer is small, it's big. Can we do that? Now if you do that, if you, if you decide that W21 is big, which means you've got to send in a lot of photons per second, but it's possible, uh, then you can get rid of A and Q, and you now have a simple result that um, N2 is just N1 times this ratio. And remember, that W is just, uh, the, the Ws are related through the uh, degeneracies. So in fact, if you have, for example, G2 equals G1, N2 equals N1, now what does that mean? That means you've created a situation in which N2 equals N1. You've taken half of the N1s and put them up here. So the nice thing is that you get closure, analytical closure, if you can do this experimentally. So that was a, a strategy that was pursued for quite a while. But you know, it, uh, we made an assumption here that the molecules can only reside in one and two. So the sum of those two, which is N10, is a constant. Well, the trouble is that molecules aren't that way. Molecules have adjacent states. And so you can't really neglect these other states. And, and that's, that's the problem. That's a problem. So anyway, there's, there's a fluorescent signals in the equations in the linear, in, in linear weak excitation and in the, in the, uh, the strong saturated excitation. So it has a virtue, but it's, it's hard to achieve. And if the laser beam has got, is, uh, got a Gaussian intensity distribution, it's not saturating in the wings. So it's got potential, but it's got problems. If it's in between, and it can be in between because you're just getting out of the linear regime. Usually you'd like to be in the linear regime, but just before it starts to become nonlinear. There is a solution. You can solve these equations because we only have two levels. You can solve the equations for the, for the intermediate. It looks like this. So you can plot, you can solve this problem for, for the two-level model. You can solve the problem for arbitrary parameters. Okay, it's in the notes. So we might look at some typical values. Um, if A is in the range of 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 8th would be for an atom. 10 to the 5th would be for a molecule. Uh, I, I rounded it up here and said 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th for, you know, no, it's just really closer to 10 to the 5th. But it could be 10 to the 8th for sodium. What's Q? Well, we go back to kinetic theory and we would talk about uh, Q, which is a, this is a uh, second seconds minus one. It was really the collision frequency. Frequency of collisions, number per second. Let's see if they say that right. That's wrong, let's see. Okay, that's right. So in the limit that all collisions can be excite because they're exothermic, this is the number you get. Then you can insert, well, that's proportion. This is the uh, collision frequency is usually described by Z. Number density of, of the, all the species, cross-section for collision, mean molecular speed. So you can say that it is proportional to the cross-section P over root T. But it's of an order of 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 10th at STP. So what does that say? If we now know this approximate expression for Q, I can insert A over Q in my linear limit, and what do I get? The A over Q, which is called <clears throat> fluorescence yield. Fraction of absorbed photons that are re-emitted. Fluorescence yield, 10 to the minus 4. So you can see what's going on here. You send in some photons. Some number are absorbed in my volume. Of those, only 10 to the minus 4 fluoresce. Of those, you only get 1%. So now we're down by 10 to the 6th. So you've got to have a big enough volume with enough absorbers and enough 
uh, incident photons to overwhelm this problem. So it's an inefficient process. But it's got all these virtues of being spatially resolved. So basically no one, not no one that I know about, does uh, infrared fluorescence in, in the gas dynamics community. <clears throat> and why is that? That's because A, instead of being 10 to the 5th or 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 8th, is 30. That's down by orders of magnitude. But it turns out that this is no long, Q is no longer a collisional electronic de-excitation. It's, it's another collisional rate. It's related to removing it from emitting states. And that number turns out to be a lot smaller. So it turns out that uh, the ratio of the Qs, even though the ratio of the As for infrared to UV is way small, uh, it, was, it was foolish on my part to forget this, that the ratio of the Qs is, can be quite different. And uh, nobody here from Cornell, so that was my student, student Brian Kirby, that worked on that problem. He's a professor at Cornell. Okay, so now we'd like to evaluate maybe uh, we'd like to evaluate the approximate intensity needed uh, to saturate. We, have, we don't have a feel for this yet. How, how intense does it have to be? So what does it take for B I to be much greater than this? We'll call that the saturated intensity. So now you have to think about, well, is Q big or is Q small? If Q is small, then you just have to have uh, A over B to be uh, a big and so on. So let's see, I work my way down here. I want to do an example. If you go down through here, uh, the given, you have to fix the wavelength and you have to pick an approximate uh, a B. You can solve for B at this wavelength. Let me do this right here. So I get numbers. And this is the relationship between B and A. Now if I assume that Q is 10 to the fourth A, because we just did this uh, a minute ago, uh, and if we take a Q collision frequency of 10 to the 10th, which is about right. It's about 10 to the 9th and 10 to the 10th in the room. You can solve for the saturation intensity required, and, it look, and you get a number. Let's see, I think the next slide makes it easier. So it's a number. It's hard to think about. Ergs per square centimeter. So I try to convert this into power. So you can now go back to intensity as power over area times frequency the width of the laser. This would, be, this would be watts per unit area per unit frequency. So if you pick a, 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 a width, width of the laser there of one millimeter, and you pick a bandwidth of a pulse laser of 0.5 wave numbers, I can, I can uh, which is the 1.5 times 10 to the 10th in, second, in hertz units, I can solve for this intensity units. And what do I get? The important point is I get five kilowatts. So, in my simple system, two-level system, it would take five kilowatts with typical values of wavelength and A coefficients to saturate. That sounds like a lot. And it is for a continuous laser that only produces uh, milliwatts or watts. But what about a pulse laser? A neobium YAG laser that gives one a, a, a really small a uh, YAG laser can give 1 to 10 millijoules per pulse per 10 nanoseconds. That's a, a megawatt. So, so pulse, this is pretty promising. So it looks like you could use a pulse laser if you had a two-level system and you had a pulse laser, uh, you, could, you could saturate. So that's a, that's a blessing and that's a curse. It just means if you're, you're dealing with... Uh, 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 situation where you want to use a lot of power to get more signal. You have to be careful you don't, uh, you have to be careful you're in the saturation or in the linear regime or you have to calibrate somehow. Therefore, it's easy to saturate within the limits of a two-level model, meaning that there's only two levels in this molecule. But in fact, it's, and so with atoms, it's actually achievable. With molecules, not so easy because uh, when you pump up there's always adjacent rotational states that are closely spaced. And that collision frequency might be 10 to the 9th. So it's big enough that uh, uh, it, it, the molecules want to redistribute fast. 
So if you pump molecules out of level one and go to level two, the depleted molecules are replaced by their neighbors. So if you only probe uh, one level, one J level, there's all these adjacent levels pumping replacements in at 10 to the ninth. So it's very hard to saturate a molecule. And that led to some different strategies of mentioning Purdue again, even Purdue. Uh, Bob Lucht uh, was the one I think of who did what's called the balance cross. Anyway, they kept pushing different models. They were really good at that stuff. His, his advisor was Norm Lorenda, who passed away. He was my contemporary. So there are, what, there are ways you can model this stuff. Um, but I, I got attracted to this infrared problem. So now A is quite a bit smaller, 30. But what's Q? Now we have to ask what Q is. It's, so Q is a funny thing. You pump it up, upstairs, and what you're asking is, what are the collisional processes that, take it, that prevent it from emitting? If it just goes to an adjacent J, it can still emit. It's only when it goes to the lower state it can't emit anymore. And that's where I, 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 I failed to think about that for a long time. But, but it turns out that uh, the collisional transfer rate, which would be transfer between different vibrational states, is maybe 10 to the fifth. So if you do the fluorescence yield, you get a number that's the same as the, for, for, for the UV. However, because A, and this is now the bugaboo of infrared. Anyone here work for Chris Goldenstein? Okay, Chris Goldenstein, my uh, student at Purdue, he, he was uh, the second or third student that had work on this. He actually, he did it for a part of his postdoc period with me. The problem is you pump it up, <clears throat> pump it up, and uh, it, you, it continues to be able to emit but it lives up there so long that you have no time resolution. That's the killer. Other than that, infrared fluorescence is great because it's a really easy way to do CO and CO2. So my idea was, couldn't we do infrared lift to look at, say, um, there's a lot of interest in, uh, in uh, vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft and, and they would exhaust a lot of interactions with the ground. And, uh, I thought, well, we could look at that plume and, and, and learn something about the distribution of, of the exhaust gases. So it's good as long as the process you're studying is slow. So we don't see it in combustion. We don't see it in combustion. But I think there are places where this would be uh, a good idea. Especially for, see, so um, absorption is good for some molecules. Fluorescence is good for some others. Sometimes you, you know, they're not usually, you can't do both. So let's just say you want to do uh, CO2. You want, to, you want to do CO2. Well, not so easy to do CO2 with UV. What about the detection limits? Now we've decided that this might be promising. Let's look at the limits that you might be able to detect. Remember, here's our signal. If it's a pulse signal, we integrate over time of that pulse. We have our standard equation here. Uh, you always know A. Number, okay, now uh, the number density in level one, now that we're kind of thinking about a molecule that has more levels, is the total number density of that species, or total number of density of all species, times the mole fraction of that species, times the fraction in the specific state that you're going to absorb. That would be N10, the number initially present in the level, which we will use to get at the number density of that species. So now we're recognizing we have uh, more levels. Okay, so if we do this, we integrate the signal. Oh, uh, if we're going to use a pulse laser, but we need to know the intensities, you got to take the pulse energy, divide it by the spectral width and the area. So we've got to get this back to uh, to uh, uh, energy at watts per square centimeter per frequency, but you only have the pulse of energy. So anyway, if you do this, you can solve for the fluorescent signal, the function of N10, which is the number we're interested in. The question is, how small a value of N10 can you measure? And it depends, on, obviously, on the energy in the pulse, the path length. So, you know, if you make a bigger path length, there's more 
there's a bigger signal. B, that's, we can't change that. That's just the probability of absorption. A, we can't change that. Q, so if we assume in the limit that A is much less than Q, we can solve for this. And this, this is in your notes. So I'd like to have an example like this to show you, well, what can you achieve with typical numbers? When you get down through here, because I don't want to take too long. If you get down through here, uh, you can solve for the uh, mole fraction you can detect. So the fluorescent signal is 10 to the seventh times the mole fraction. So the mole fraction is one part per million, 10 to the minus six. I still have 30 photons. And if you know anything about photon statistics, you know the uh, noise level, the signal noise level goes to the square of the number of uh, photons. So 30 photons is enough to at least see something. So now you have to be know something else. When the photons come out, they hit a quantum detector. Not all photons go to electrons. Only the, a fraction uh, eta do. And so I have to take that into account. So the ultimate shot noise limited detection, I've got to put that eta in there. It's the square root of this number now. If I assume eta is 10%, which is reasonable, what does that mean? Bottom line is I have a detection limit here of 0.3 ppm. Now I'm getting interested again. I can detect parts per million with this concept. This is why the chemists really like this, this stuff. You could do this with 10 microjoules of energy. Saturation limit. Now we have to ask, well, how much power does it take to saturate? I think I'm running way over, so I better pick it up. Uh, you can do saturation. It's in your notes. What do we want to know? Uh, okay, the question was, What's the detection limit if you're in the uh, uh, weak regime? What's the detection limit if you're in the saturation regime? Turns out we only pick up a little bit. You only buy another factor of five or 10. So it's not like saturation buys you a lot of sensitivity for detection. Okay, characteristic times. How many slides do I have? I think I'm running way over. Um, I like to think about the time scales of different processes to guide our thinking. Uh, let's see if I can, if it's on the next page here. Oh, okay. So I've used uh, time scales. Let's see. Typically, the laser pulse looks like this. And someone might say, what about the steady state approximation here? Is it okay to use steady state to set this time derivative equal to zero? when we're working with such short, such short times. And so this slide, if you can study it, is enough that we'll be able to show you that the uh, uh, that this equation is going to, I, I didn't say this right. In the weak limit, we're still going to be fine if there's enough time to reach steady state. This slide is going to try to help us define, decide how long it takes. So, that, okay, I, def I always define the steady state time, the time to reach steady state as the number in the steady state divided by the initial rate of excitation. So that, if I take the number in this plateau, divide by the initial rate of formation, I can get a characteristic time. And that characteristic time is this number right here. Now remember, this Q is a lot bigger than A, so the, these times can be really short. Uh, if, uh, if Q is 10 to the uh, uh, ninth, say, I'm thinking about time, characteristic times here of, of less than 10 to the minus ninth. So I'm okay. I'm okay. Before you get into trouble, and this is where the Purdue people would have to step in, how do you think about this when you go to times, when you go to lasers that are shorter than nanosecond lasers? And that's the, where my friend Bob Bluck is. He, he's in, he's, he uses what's called, uh, uh, what's the name of that? Anyway, he has, you, have to, you can no longer use the steady state approximation you have to think about this in the quantum limit. So there's a theory. And, but in that theory, you can get into some, some strange things, some oscillations, and uh, that's beyond me. So, but if you go to femtosecond lasers, uh, picosecond lasers even, you gotta rethink some of these relationships. Okay, I think I'm gonna zing ahead. Oh, so what if you send in too much light? If you send too much, too much light, you burn a hole in the line. 
So remember, we have this line shape. You send in too much, you start removing molecules from that frequency class. You can get hole burning. Okay, this was really, I wanted to tell you what, how do we deal with the case where molecules have multiple levels. So now a better picture is, oops, we'll go back here. A better picture is we got level one and level two, but both level one and level two have neighbors. Right now, let's talk about the neighbors up here. So what happens is you get pumped up to here, and you have to wait for a microsecond for this to happen. But meanwhile, collisions are taking place, and you're going to, you're either quenching by 10 to the ninth, or you're undergoing vibrational relaxation up here, or your collision, or rotation. These rotational collisions are fast. What that means is, is that this quickly becomes the case where the emission is taking place from a lot of different states. Multi-level effects, I think it's, uh, we've got way too much material in this lecture, sorry. You're gonna have to ask me some questions about this. Um, way too much. Anyway, the, the bottom line is, if the quantum yield for the molecules that are excited by these collisions after the initial excitation. If the quantum yield stays the same, turns out my two-level model still holds exactly. I don't think, it, I've never seen this anywhere else, but I, I, I did this as a homework problem for myself. So what does that mean? That means my simple two-level model is still useful. As long as A over Q is the same for all of the uh, subsequent collision part, collisional events in the upper state, I still get exactly the same answer. That's amazingly beautiful, simple result. Okay. Way, I'm sorry, I have way too much stuff today. And the, and the way you want to think about this is the fluorescence signal is really defined by the uh, collision bandwidth. If you have, there's another Purdue thing. Uh, they decided that they could solve this uh, quenching problem by collecting only the light from J, J prime and not the adjacent J prime. In my model, you collect the light from all the other J prime. If you collect only that one, then you get away from, from almost everything. But what's the problem? You get no signal. Yeah, so, so, you know, you just, it's hard to find a really good answer. But if you want signal, you've got to collect all the light. Then you have to figure out what it means. This is, so it's in my notes. I don't think, I've never seen this anywhere else, but uh, to, to yield this final answer that uh, fluorescence yield is still in the limit of this complicated molecule. It's still A over A plus Q. Next slide. Okay, I'm sorry I ran over. I'll let you go for a few minutes. Any last any question before you escape? I think these notes are pretty complete. You can read through them, even though I, I, I didn't pace myself very well. Next lecture is going to be a okay. Next lecture is on lift for small molecules, and the last lecture will be on lift for big molecules. Everyone looks dazed. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll let you go. Yeah, if you have any questions, come see me. Okay. So the question is something uh, like, do we see uh, improvements in the theory? I guess it could be the, the, uh, our ability to calculate Q, you mean? That would be one example. So, I mean, these equations are correct. There's no... We have to always worry about whether there's any influence of, uh, of saturation, but if we're in the linear regime, equations are fine. It's all about how do we calculate Q. We have good knowledge of the A coefficients. So it's really, uh, as you're gonna see, or maybe the people here know, it's very hard to make quantitative measurements. The challenge is there's not so much in the theory. It's the, it's the knowledge of Q uh, and then there's just the practical difficulties of, uh, of using detectors that are spectrally sensitive and calibration factors. And so gradually the science gets better, the ability to do the experiments gets better, equipment gets better. But I don't think it's so much a uh, theory is pretty much static, I would say. Any other question before I start? 
Okay, so let's, we're going to go through some examples here. So let's just say you want to image OH quantitatively. So you, you might say, well, I'll go into a, a Hankin burner and where I think I know the OH concentration, maybe because I measured absorption. So you might use absorption to say, well, at that flame condition, I've got my calibration factors. And, but what happens is, is when you change the calibration condition, let's just say now, maybe everything stays the same, but you change the burner flow. So therefore, you've changed the, the combustion gas mixture. You, you've lost your calibration. So maybe you get an average calibration factor, but that's a real problem. This collisional quench rate is uh, highly dependent on the mixture. And, it, and so there's the quenching by the nitrogen, the oxygen, the water. Water is very, so that's the problem. There's no constant. You can get the, you can calibrate the uh, measurement volume. You can do a lot of things, but uh, you, that darn Q is the killer. So when people say, uh, when will they show their plif images? There's kind of the impression that they're quantitative. They're not, they're spatially quantitative, they're temporally quantitative, and they are not concentration quantitative. So you think, well, I'm going to... Exactly. So they're quantitative in the sense that they're spatially and spectrally. Spatially and temporally. But to say that I've just determined OH to, to 2%, no way. No way. Now, if you... How do you calibrate it? You, you go into something that itself is not that well known. So you're going to use a thermocouple, which is uncertain to 40 degrees Kelvin. How do you how do you produce uh, something with this accurately accurately known? You can get close, and then you calibrate, and then if everything stays about the same, you're okay. The question is, what's the range over which your calibration factors hold? That's the killer. Well, it's not a killer; it just means that it's harder and harder to to uh, interpret. Temperature has some, in some ways, is easier because you take ratios and some things are, are, are better off that way. But, but I deal with some of that here now. Okay, so we're going to talk about small molecules versus big molecules. Small molecules because those are the things that people usually want to measure. Big molecules because we can use tracers to get at flow field properties without having to uh, solving some problems. So this is a typical setup. Uh, light formed into a sheet, typically pulse laser. Uh, light's collected by some optical components and it goes onto a camera. In this case, it was the infrared camera that we were using. We were looking at a repetitive uh, 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 force jet uh, of CO and CO2, I remember. So you can, you can have an infrared camera, but everybody really uses uh, UV intensified cameras for the most part. So I'll introduce, I'll talk about OH plif, uh, infrared, hypersonic flows challenges, uh, hypersonic flows results, and some other, and then I'm going to show, show some example results. So basically, you span the beam into a sheet, uh, and that sheet might be a centimeter high, could be five centimeters high, it might be. Of course, you're spreading the light out. So you're distributing the light, you're going to have less light. Your signal always depends upon the amount of light that's coming in. So remember, fluorescence is photons in, fraction collected, fraction, uh, fraction, fraction, fraction absorbed, uh, fraction collected. Um, I'm still not getting it right. Fraction, <laughs> photons in, fraction absorbed. Fraction uh, fluorescence yield and, and fraction collected. So if you think about those three, three things. Okay, uh, there may be. So you may have, you may have an intensified camera here. So that yeah, the camera is really an intensifier that takes the, say the UV photons, and converts them to. Uh, uh, electrons which impact a phosphor which then produce visible photons that go into your camera. So camera is a kind of a, uh, it's a short word for a multi-element uh, device. And those cameras can be very fast. The intensifiers will have some quantum efficiency. So they may be 10, 20, 
30%, meaning that it every 10 photons may maybe only give you three electrons. So your losses all along the way. Of course, you know, you may have an experiment that's uh, uh, repetitive. You can do some averaging. There's a lot of possibilities for improving the signal-noise ratio. Okay, there's some interest in uh, doing three-dimensional blip or sometime, or even 4D. Uh, this has been done over, over time. Different groups have tried it at different times. Um, we did this about uh, maybe 1985, 19, somewhere in there, by using a, a spinning mirror. So the, the light beam comes in and it bounces off a mirror that's rota uh, rotating fast. And so you send the sheet through different parts of this flow and then you record on the camera. So when we did this, we had a, we had a, a long pulse laser, actually a microsecond pulse length. And then we had a fast camera. So we would gate the camera and look at um, uh, short periods of time. It's called, it's called an imicon. So we basically could get a, uh, an image this way just by collecting uh, different uh, illumination planes and building an image. I guess that reminds me. We've also done experiments where you have a, 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 a repetitively pulsed flow so that you could phase average. You could take uh, images at different uh, phases and average them, uh, superpose them over time. And then you can do that in different locations. So we built up a cube of data at an instant in time, instant phase. You could get a, a cube of data. Uh, when we first did this, there was so much data we didn't, couldn't handle it. But I had a friend who works for Pixar. So we got a special computer data storage thing. So you can generate a lot of data very fast. In those days, that was a problem. Nowadays, it's not such a problem. Okay. Of course, to do this, you have to move the... The, uh, the mirror fast and uh, so on. But this is at least a way to do this with a single laser rather than using multiple lasers. Okay, so one of the things, probably the most common thing that people want to measure is the number density. For example, OH or, or, or perhaps CH or perhaps formaldehyde. So you look, what you're after is to, is to go from the signal in photons or photons per second uh, to get to number density. So here's our relationship. So we use the number density and initial number density in level one of the quantum state of OH that we want to measure. And we have our, our fluorescence relationship. But the main thing is if you look over here, you see that the number density in level one is the number density of, of the species OH times the Boltzmann fraction over Q. So you can kind of think of Q being the uh, dominant term here. So that the signal is proportional to the number density of the species times the Boltzmann fraction over the quench rate. So usually you know uh, A and B, the uh, effective volume that you can get from calibration, usually with, say, Rayleigh scattering. So you use Rayleigh scattering taking, uh, say, nitrogen, which has a known Rayleigh scattering cross-section, send in light, collect your signal, and you can get back uh, information on the volume and, and so on. So you know the, from Rayleigh scattering, you know the differential cross-section here. And so you can basically uh, set the number density in the experiment, uh, and you can infer and measure the signal, and you can infer uh, the effective volume and, and, and the collection angle and so on. So that basically you can get uh, calibration constant for the intensity volume, and uh, solid angle. Okay, so what we're after is to get the number density of the species. So what you do is you recognize that if this is a temperature-bearing system, you collect quantum, you, you select quantum states B and J to give this independent T. This is now pretty simple. So if you go back and say, what I really want is this number density, and I'm worried about the influence of temperature. Pick a quantum state that's temperature insensitive. Ar and argue that Q is a constant. These are approximations. But that's the quickest way to get to something that looks like a true uh, uh, number density or mole fraction. 
Now, if you only want to know the mole fraction, it's actually simpler. If you only want to know the mole fraction, and you, and you realize, take from the last slide, that our signal is proportional to all these things we know from calibration times the number density of the species, Boltzmann fraction over n sigma c bar. That's the uh, that's an expression for q. So now you can look at this, and I'll rewrite this. Uh, I, I replace q with the total number density of, of colliders, an average cross-section mean molecular speed. And when you do that, you realize I can write this as a function of the mole fraction. So if you only want to know the mole fraction, and if you pick a proper transition, so the first thing you would do is you pick B and J to make them temperature, to make the ratio of that to, to Q temperature intensity. So if you think that Q is proportional to the square root of T from up here, you pick this transition to be proportional, this Boltzmann fraction to be proportional to the square root of T, and you're close. We made some approximations, but you're close. So if you're after a mole fraction, that's the strategy. So you basically argue that uh, you, if, uh, if Q can be replaced by N sigma C bar, sigma is the cross section, and the main temperature dependence is in C bar, then you can get the C by calibration. So you'd go to your Hankin burner, and you, this is what you would do. This is the start. So the first thing you do is you don't necessarily, you don't pick the line with the strongest, the highest Boltzmann fraction. No, you pick the line that has the temperature intensity Boltzmann fraction. Well, temperature intensity over square root of T. Simple idea. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty effective idea. Temperature. Temperature is really important. So now let's go back. So we're doing everything by this approximated form here. Signal is proportional to some things we can measure, calibration constants, mole fraction, Boltzmann fraction over sigma t. So now what do you want to do? You, you, can, you can use a tracer with a fixed mole fraction. So we did quite a few experiments back in the mid-80s with nitric oxide. We seeded nitric oxide into a flame under conditions where it stayed more or less constant. So if it has a fixed mole fraction, we just have to pick a quantum state of the NO so that this thing is, is temperature sensitive. So you're picking quantum states to give you high or low temperature sensitivity. That's a really simple idea. It's not perfect. The alternative is the two-line strategy, which is common. No tracer. Now you can, you're basically arguing here that the ratio of these fluorescent signals after you take out the calibration parameters is proportional to these terms, which because the number densities cancel, it's the Boltzmann ratio. So that sounds easy. Of course, you've got to do the calibrations, and maybe one laser's got more intensity than the other, and maybe it's fluctuating, and so on. So there's, but that's the best strategy. What, this strategy gives you high temperature sensitivity, as long as you can minimize the sensitivity to your experimental parameters in the in the camera and the and the filters and the intensifiers and so on. So these are the simple arguments for getting to temperature, LAF to temperature. Okay, I'd like to just give a little history um, from, uh, on fluorescence. Uh, Cliff, in particular. So the first example of this was around 1981, 1982. Uh, we did it at Stanford. SRI did it. They didn't use a digital camera, but they did it at, at out nearly the same time. And the Swedish people did it along a line. All this happened really fast. People got onto the idea that we can, everybody was doing LAF. It was like, well, why don't we do line LAF? <laughs> why don't we do? <laughs> so, so, and, that, and so that set off a revolution, really. We did an experiment where we looked at the Turbulent Flames General Electric Research Center. Oh, yeah, this is, uh, so we did, uh, uh, yeah, when we got on to biacetyl, we could excite biacetyl with a uh, biacetyl. We could excite it in this uh, pulse. It's called a blooming jet. My colleague, Professor Bill Reynolds, was really interested in the fluid mechanics of, a, of these blooming jets, he called them. So the, the jet fluid was exhausted uh, periodically and forced, and it would, it would bloom. And so 
we set it as a goal, as kind of a tribute to him, really, that we would collect a cube of data at a fixed point in phase. So you would, uh, re you know, it's a force flow. And we seeded it with biacetal. We excited it at, uh, I think it was xenon fluoride laser. And you get the fluorescence. So what's the fluorescent signal? Fluorescent signal depends upon the in incident intensity, which is repetitive. It's proportional to the seed. So you seed this with something. You seed this with some biacetal. And then you, so the signal should be proportional to the amount of biacetal, which is, uh, 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 I didn't say that right. You're watching the mixing of the biacetal with the ambient. So it's a measurement of the, mole fra of the local mole fraction of biacetal. And the problem was when we did this, we had more data than we knew what to do with. We had to get this special Pixar computer. Um, but that we got shut, shut down <laughs> because of fear of cancer. So we discovered acetone, and we, we found that acetone is really great. Acetone, uh, we will learn in the next lecture. Acetone has some really desirable properties. So you trace the acetone, and if you, and if you understand the, uh, the quantum yield, which we do, you have an instantaneous measurement of that flow field. All right, we got interested in uh, uh, supersonic jets, a jet into supersonic uh, cross flow. So this is a supersonic flow coming this way, jet of hydrogen going in. So it was a model scramjet. Uh, that was, and that took two lasers. We could do two-line thermometry. We could do two species. And then I put in this on our velocity. So we learned that if we could bring in these, uh, these beams at angles and look at a steady flow, we could sort out the velocity field. And uh, sure enough, that worked. So you can do uh, Doppler-based velocimetry using PLIF also. Scramjets, uh, imaging of temperature, OK. I would say that from 2000 on, PLIF is kind of it's, it's universal. People use it for all sorts of purposes. Um, the lasers get better. Cameras are already good. It's, uh, there's a lot more applications now. Some of the research, I know people are trying to do a PLIF in the rotating detonation engines. So sometimes it's difficult, uh, but the concepts are really there. Uh, they haven't changed. I'd say the main thing is, is that uh, applications and the use of uh, pulse burst lasers. Really expensive approach, but you can take pictures at really high speed. So when we did our first work, the laser is, t is 10 hertz. Initially, the cameras were slower, but then eventually the cameras are equally fast. So you go from 10 hertz to a kilohertz, and now people can go up to 100 kilohertz. So that's been a big move. Pulse burst lasers started, I think, at Princeton. OK, a very old slide here. Oh, Jerry Seisman, anyone here from Georgia Tech? So my, one of my students, a professor at Georgia Tech. He was a great, great student. OK, we were, we were looking at uh, uh, turbulent, turbulent uh, combustion. These are the pictures he took around 1990. I think the pictures today are still no better than this. Instantaneous images of the OH in a turbulent jet as a function of the, of the Reynolds number. And, and so you can see how the flame structure, what was this? This was uh, hydrogen diffusion flame in air, two millimeter jet. So images were two to 41 diameters downstream. Uh, typically, when you look at one of these things, you look on the left and the right, and you'll see a little bit of asymmetry. That usually means the laser's coming in from one side, and you've lost some light. But look what you can do. I mean, the structure that you can see is a function of Reynolds number. This is what gets people excited about PLAF for turbulence. At least you see spatially what's happening, spatially. But the hard part's making it truly quantitative. But the qual this is what was done even back around 1990. Then, of course, what's really interesting is you cut this jet with a horizontal plane. And look at the beautiful pictures that he was able to get at this Reynolds number. Now, what would be beyond this? <laughs> 
people would come along and say, well, let's do a hydrocarbon flame instead of a hydrogen. And then you can image OH, CH, and formaldehyde. And you can look and say, now all of a sudden you have a question, where's the flame? How do you even define the flame location? It's a region, and the peak of the region for CH is different than the peak of OH, is different than the peak of temperature. So it's a flame, but where's the flame front? Well, it's really a zone. But look at that structure. So that's a real challenge for the, for the computational people to get that. So it's a, it's, this is a really beautiful thing. This was uh, my student, Brian Kirby. I told you we could do CO2. Um, so we had an infrared camera. It was expensive. Um, high speed camera. So we could see this, this, and this was a flow of a, a pulse flow, room temperature flow, with a forced CO2 jet. So it's a CO2 jet. So what you're seeing is the CO2 mixing with the ambient and therefore declining uh, mole fractions. This was yeah, Brian Kirby. So you can see how powerful this can be if you could just decide how to make it quantitative. Now, you may notice that I, we excited two microns, and we detect at four. So this kind of connects back with what we talked about in earlier lectures uh, about the energy level structure of CO2, CO2 being linear, 3n minus 5, four vibrational modes, new 1, new 2, which is degenerate, and new 3, two microns. So we excited some vibrational mode, which then transferred energy to another quantum state, and we watched it. So that's uh, the kind of strategy you have to use to separate out the laser excitation wavelength from what you're after. I still think this has got a lot of pro uh, applications, but probably not in combustion. That's, that's the problem. Here's the, here's, the, uh, here's the explanation of how this works. Oh, there's a lot of interesting ideas here. So if we have um, carbon monoxide, so this would be 4.6 microns here. This would be 2.3 microns here. Here's the, energy here's the first energy level in this mode of CO. Oh, CO is uh, uh, heteronuclear diatomic. CO and N2 have very similar vibrational spacings. So you can do this with, uh, uh, you can do a jet with CO, CO2, and nitrogen. And here's the energy level structure of nitrogen. Here's the energy level structure of CO. Here's the energy level structure of the new three band of CO2. That would be the asymmetric stretch. So a strategy that we came up with is, well, we would excite here then we can look at the radiation from here and from here. And we can see what happens when this uh, mode transfers light over to here and then it emits. All of a sudden, you, I thought, this is a way to look at what's called micro mix, uh, molecular mixing. We could decide one species and we could look, collect the light from those species which had had a collision, that had photon transferred. So this one is dark. These photons, the, the energy transfer over here does not produce a photon. The energy transfer from here produces another color photon. So if you excite at 2.3 and collect at 4.3 and 4.7, you've watched the flow of energy between CO and CO2. It was great. But, what is, but in, uh, to interpret this, First, you use the line position information that we talked about in the first several lectures. Now you start asking, where does the energy flow? And this process right here is called VV, vibrational energy transfer. So if you excite to here in pure CO, it would be de-excited by vibrational transfer, uh, excuse me, VT, vibrational translation. So there's a vibrational translation excitation and there's vibrational vibration coupling. This is called VVV or VET. So by interrogating, by looking at different uh, uh, flow fields, we could look at the relative uh, rate 
We could look at the emission from CO2 and from CO and look at the rate of transfer of these things. We got these, oh, and then someone, uh, someone gave me a high power CO2 laser. And I thought, this is what I was thinking. Maybe we could look at the uh, exhaust of, a, of, a, of an engine as a plane was trying to take off from the ground, vertical takeoff. So this was an interesting idea. So we would take uh, if, the CO2 laser that you would buy for industrial processing. The CO2 laser you'd buy for industrial processing would be one that you could pump to, um, let's see where it goes here, asymmetric stretch. Uh, the laser is 10.6 uh, microns. The, 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 uh, the laser that you, industrial laser, 10.6 microns. And so somehow you get, you, you pump to specific states and by looking at the emission, you, you, can, see, uh, you can see a transfer. So where did I go here? You pump to 10.6. Okay, pump to here. Let's, now I'm, I'm forgetting how we did this. Vibration, anyway, vibrational energy transfer led to uh, quantum here. One, this is new three mode. And we looked at the emission at 4.3 because our camera only worked at 4.3. Yeah. So basically, this signal came from the excited at 10 microns, but led to emission at, uh, at 4.3, which tracks the temperature of this jet. So that was a great picture. We could look at hot CO2. It only works when the gas is hot. Only works when the gas is hot. I'm not explaining this very well. It's been too long. So anyway, I'm just showing you that you can do infrared PLF. If you're interested, you have to study it. Okay. Um, Yale, Yale is a place where they really worked hard on Raman spectroscopy. So they would look at this, uh, and they've worked hard on this, uh, this particular flame here. Uh, methane fueled flame, uh, diff diffusion flame. And they would collect images like this of the CO2. Now they're using Raman, so they can infer CO2 and they can infer, uh, and they can infer CO2 is the main thing. So they'd look at the production of CO2 using Raman spectroscopy in this flame, which is a steady flame. They're CFD looks like this. Their, ROM, their data looked like this. And they did along a line. They did Raman along a line. And they averaged 5,000 shots. And did a line. This is what we get using 36 shots in a plane. So this is 5,000 per, per row. And then you got to scan this way. So the point is, fluorescence is a lot stronger than Raman. If you can do it. This is our single shot. That was a 36 shot average. So, and if we average longer, I guess we would start to approximate to this. So that demonstrated uh, IR PLIF. Let's see, we took three, what is this, three joules? Okay, we took this commercial, yeah, IBM gave it to me, just a commercial laser. It, it gave off ten, three joules of light at 10.6 microns. And that, by the process that I didn't explain very well, <laughs> leads to emission at 4.3. So we we're just looking for a way to excite the 4.3. So we excite the 4.3 and we make a measurement that's proportional to the CO2. Now, we still have the problem, how do you make it truly quantitative? We get signal, but then you have to, you have to, you have, to have a, a model for the fluorescence yield. And uh, that was hard, but we did that. Uh, he did it, and then my Chris Goldenstein did, did, it, did it also. Okay, I showed you this before. Uh, diagnostic needs and opportunities for scramjets. We, I showed you how we do this. I wanted to do it for tunable diode lasers. Uh, 
one of the problems is how do you test these things? And they test them in uh, impulse facilities because you have to generate high enthalpy flows so that when you accelerate it to the relevant speeds and temperatures, uh, you simulate uh, flight. So this is typically done in either a reflected shock tunnel or an expansion tube. And so uh, I'm showing this in part because uh, somebody here works with Mirko Gamba. Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, the student who did this actually was uh, Will Helsley. Will Helsley was a PhD student, uh, mostly a professor of Godfrey Mungo. Will was a real engineer. I think he came from Caltech. Anyway, uh, Godfrey and Will designed this, designed and built, assembled, and began to test this facility in less than one year. Amazing. Uh, no supply chain problems at that time. Anyway, an expansion tube is a shock tube with an additional section. So there's a, uh, there's a driver section here in the diaphragm. Uh, then there's so the, the uh, test gas and another diaphragm, and then the so-called expansion section which is usually filled with a low pressure of helium. And so you, you break this diaphragm, sends a shock wave down to here. But instead of reflecting, it breaks a very wimpy diaphragm and expands into a low pressure region. And that's called an unsteady expansion fan. So this test gas, which is here, goes through that expansion fan and is accelerated. So you, the whole idea of this thing is to take this gas and accelerate it to two kilometers a second for a very short period of time, 100 microseconds maybe. And then you take images here as the gas flows out this, this uh, tunnel here. So over here we have some, um, at that time, a uh, neodymium YAG laser and a dye laser. We were using dye lasers in that point in time. And you can send this light in from different orientations. We also had Schlieren. So you could do shingle, single shot. Well, we could only do single shot because the repetition rate of the laser was way too low. We also could do eight-frame Schlieren. So this is a way to produce high-speed, high-enthalpy flow for a short period of time over a body. Will built it. Uh, then some other students made use of it. Will was fascinated with SpaceX and left a month before he finished his PhD. He rose to be vice president at SpaceX. And then he recently left, if you read the aerospace news. He was vice president for propulsion. He left. I think it's hard to work for Elon Musk, I've heard. Uh, I've heard from more than one person it's hard to work for Elon Musk. In fact, just as, as an aside, if you, and if you read Time Magazine, about a week ago they had an article on J.B. Straubel, four pages, uh, a Stanford student who co-founded Tesla with uh, Elon Musk. Actually, they, didn't re they actually kind of stole it from another person, but that's another story. But JB uh, was in charge of the powertrain. He had a master's from Stanford. Got he, he, while he was a student, he, he, uh, had, his, he had a Porsche and he, electri he electrified it. Built. So he was really into this stuff. So he was in charge of the powertrain. And, but in the Time Magazine, it reveals that he too had a hard time getting along with uh, Elon Musk. And so he started his own big company on recycling batteries. Anyway, we had this facility and we used it for a while. Uh, three or four students, and, uh, and, and then Merkel Gamba was the postdoc. Merkel made use of this facility. Uh, I got interested in this idea of, uh, in fact, okay, we built an expansion. I had no money, so we, I took an old shock tube and we built it into an expansion tube, and we used it to study what's called the uh, ram accelerator. Anybody know what a ram accelerator is? Okay. The ram accelerator was the idea that you would take a Navy gun, and instead of shooting a projectile with powder, you would, you would fill this barrel with, com with a detonable gas. You launch the, uh, the projectile, the bullet, into this tube, and then you would rely on the acceleration caused by detonation waves. The detonation would occur behind this projectile and accelerate it, and you would, the hope was that you could get it uh, to be better than a conventional Navy gun. And they were studying this problem. Well, what's happening inside this tube as this bullet is progressing along? How do you model it? Detonation waves are hard to model. How do you model it? Navy was really interested in this, the Army. And uh, so I thought, you know, why don't we fix the projectile and flow the gas? 
So I built this, my students built this expansion tube, and we put this model here, and we flow it. So basically, driver, oh, that's just a buffer. Don't worry about that. This is test gas. Here's helium. So you, you break the diaphragm, you accelerate this gas, it goes through the unsteady expansion fan, and that's what we care about. And it flows over this body. So that means you're float instead of the projectile flowing into the combustible gas, combustible gas is flowing over the projectile. I did that first, and we did, uh, I think I'm going to show you, we, we, did, uh, we also did scramjet testing. I couldn't get the Air Force to pay for this. Tore it down. One year later, they decided this was a big deal, and they gave us the money, half a million dollars to build the expansion tube that I showed you a minute ago. So it was a good idea. Uh, so here's, here's what you do. And, um, here's some examples where you have a mixture of nitric oxide, methane, and nitrogen flowing, in this case, over a blunted cylinder. And this is the image that you get. This is a PLF image. And this is a, 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 a wedge, 40-degree wedge. And so you, you should know from compressible gas dynamics, if you have a, a wedge of known angle and you have a shock wave of known angle, that determines this Mach number. The angle of this shock is set by the specific heat, the ratio of specific heat, gamma, and the Mach number, period. So this is how you calibrate a tunnel. Take a wedge of known angle, use your high-speed clearing, and you see what is this uh, shock angle. That gives you the Mach number. But you can also look at flow over a cylinder like this, and you can see the standoff distance. So what were we, we were using NOPLIF. So we use the NOPLIF, shock, the speeds are like 2,200 meters per second, Mach 7, of, of room temperature air. So the expansion tube excel, uh, heats the gas a little bit, but expands it down to a temperature of 280 degrees and Mach 7. So this is a, this is a poor man's wind home. Impulse facility gives you maybe 100 microseconds of test time. But I was interested in what happens if you have a detonable mixture. So if you have, um, here's a case where you have uh, that, that high speed. You know, if you know about uh, detonations, you care about this uh, Chapman Shugay speed. So what happens if you take methane? Methane was the fuel of interest when you were doing a ram accelerator. What happens when you have a methane-oxygen mixture and it's coming towards the cylinder? And the uh, CJ velocity is about 2 kilometers per second. But the oncoming speed is 2.2. That means that the detonations cannot move forward. But what happens now, what happens now if we, if we uh, look behind the shock wave under conditions where detonations can move, you can see some structure that begins to appear. So here you see this steady, the next slide I show this, oh, I, I got my story wrong. Um, I got my story wrong, sorry. Uh, these two are cases where the CJ velocity is less than the oncoming velocity. What happens if the CJ velocity is higher than the oncoming velocity? This destination wants to escape. The speed of these detonable gases, is, of, the, of the detonation front, is faster. And so it propagates out and perturbs the shock front. And so this was a really interesting challenge for uh, uh, Professor Matsuo and uh, in, in, in Japan. So the, the computational people were looking for detonation flow fields that they could try to compute. With, and we had experimental data. This was really a big deal to, to measure the, the flow field structure. We were using, uh, uh, mostly using OH. I think we were using OH PLIF. Uh, so that was an interesting application of the expansion tube and PLF. These are just examples. So then I had a student, Abdella uh, Ben-Yakar, professor at UT Austin. And uh, she's the one who did, she said, let's use this for a scramjet. So she would take, uh, she took a, 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 a flat plate with a hole in it and, a, and injected a hole. And uh, we were going to do uh, plif and Schlieren in the expansion tube. And uh, if you look at a textbook for jet and, and cross flow, it looks like a nice steady problem like this. Ah, but if you look at high speed in a real facility, it looks like this. We only had an eight-frame camera. This is a high-speed clearing of a 
2.4 kilometer per second oncoming stream of hydrogen, hydrogen jet. This was air, 1,200 Kelvin. So if the temperature is low, it does not ignite. If it's above about 1,100 Kelvin, it begins to ignite. So we're seeing uh, uh, the effect of heat release. So this is a single shot. We can see that there's, a, so this flow field that you like to think is steady, it's not steady at all, it's very unsteady. You can see the, the oscillations and the shock structure. So that's a challenge for the computational people. Why, why and how uh, does it do this? I'm getting close now to the stuff that um, Merca did. So then, uh, so we did that in the cheap expansion tube, which we then tore down built a big expansion tube, and along came uh, uh, Will Helsley, some students, and then Mirko Gamba. And we looked at this problem. So uh, Mach 10, so this is you know scramjet problem. How does fuel mix? In a scramjet, the fuel has to be mix and burn in one millisecond. So there's a lot of, a lot of fluid mechanics in that problem. Um, Mach 13, oxygen, this is air, this is oxygen. So this is OH. So basically, look at this one. Here's the jet. Here's the, the, uh, the burning flame front as, it, as the jet is mixing out here. And this is the upstream recirculation zone. So there's an upstream region in which OH is burning. Well, the fluid people really care about what's called the jet momentum ratio. So, uh, so what am I showing you? These are applications, early, early year applications of PLIF. So you get a lot of information, even though OH is not quantitative. You get structural information on the flow field. And you can decide, well, how do you design your flame holder? What's the design of your cavity? You can see what you could get by doing <coughs> things like that. OK, we're getting close. So uh, Mirko was in uh, Gamba was an energetic fellow and he put in a lot of time and fired a lot of shots and so he went back to this flow field we'd studied before and he decided he was going to collect a lot of data. So he took pictures repeating the experiment over and over and over and so now you're, here's the jet. We're looking down on the jet and you're looking at OH, Y over D is the height above the diameter of this jet. So we're looking, we're, look down here. This is uh, when you're just barely above the surface. I don't think anybody has done cliff closer to a surface. He's down there at about half of a millimeter above the surface. And you're seeing the, here's the, uh, the OH that's produced by this jet. The upstream burning, all the stuff on the sides. And so in a plane, single shot at that location. And he repeated it at all these different locations. He built up this amazing uh, data set. Uh, three different planes. Uh, really an amazing data set that he acquired. You have to kind of get your perspective here. Here's the, here's the floor of the tunnel. This is the cross plane. This is the side plane. And so he would, this is a movie. Good, I'm glad it's playing. So he, he acquired, I don't know how many, 30, 40, 50 images, built it into a movie. So you get a, it's not exactly quantitative, but it is spatially quantitative. It's temporally quantitative. And it's amazing what you can do. And we did that in a tunnel that only has you know, 100 microseconds, or, yeah, 100 microseconds of test time. So he, he, would, he would have to repeat this experiment over and over and over. And we had to have a fast operating valve to get the hydrogen in there and so on. OK, uh, there was a time back around 1990, I guess, when I had a lot of money. And uh, we would have a couple of different PLIF systems running at the same time. And the students would use an eczema pump dye laser with frequency doubling. So they use these two lasers to do two lines of NO, or to do two lines of OH, or to do NO and OH. And they would be pulsed just slightly separated in time. And they would get collected. Uh, on cameras. So here's the lasers. Uh, he's showing, we're showing here a single ICD. So you could get an intensified camera that will collect two pulses separated by, say, a microsecond. And that's what we were using at that time. So we, it was a difficult experiment. Students were great. Um, 
So here's the flow. We did this in the shock tube. Uh, so this is the, here's the high-speed flow, incident shock wave. has gone over here. And here's our jet behind a backward-facing step, hydrogen jet, and we're going to look at the structure and how it evolves with time and, and, and space. So it's been around 1990 now. And so, so the big difference between then and now is we couldn't do it at high speed. Now you could probably do this at uh, you know, 100 kilohertz or something. So now if you put NO in the free stream and the hydrogen is in the jet and you do two colors, take the ratio, and we pick the lines intelligently so that we get rid of some calibration factors. So basically this is the temperature map over here. Cold is uh, black or, or blue, hot is yellow. High speed air, NO in the free stream, cold jet. So the hydrogen comes in cold, stays blue. Uh, now, what are we doing? We're seeding, we're seeding the flow, and we can decide whether we're going to put the NO, seeding it with NO. So it, I told somebody, what's a good high temperature tracer is the question. What's a good species that is not too chemically reactive at high temperatures? NO. The best one we got. There's nothing that's really good. You'd like it to be completely chemically inert. But anyway, if you put uh, NO only in the jet, and this is a picture of the jet fluid, including that where it's mixed. You see, it's interesting. It gets hot along the wall, so that's where it's going to burn. It stays cold out here, just downstream of the, of, the, uh, of the shock front. So this is a picture of mixing of the jet fluid, the temperature of the mixed jet fluid. And we determined, well, they claim they determined this to about 50 degrees in this picture. Or we can seed you know, also into the free stream. So now we're getting a picture of everything. This one's great because you can see, if you know where to look, you can see here's the, uh, the bow shock in front of the wave. Here's the, uh, the bow shock in front of the mixing fluid. You can see where the fluid is mixing. You can see how the temperature stays hot in the, in the free stream. And you can see how the temperature builds up in this. If you look close, you can even see uh, waves in here. And you can see that it gets hot along this wall. So it, it, the hot temperature, high temperature gas comes over this uh, step and then mixes along the wall and gets hot. These were, so these were like around 1990. So this is a picture he could look at, he could use his two cameras. He could measure NO, he could measure temperature, he could measure OH. He, and so we were curious about, uh, he put NO, in this case, he put NO into the, uh, into the jet. You can see how the jet fluid mixes. Or he could measure OH as a combustion product. And you notice how it doesn't form until you get down here about, about 18 to 20 diameters. It starts to form along the wall and also out here in this mixing layer. And this is the composite down here. So that's, I think that's a great example of the power of uh, PLIF for species like NO and OH and for temperature. He also took some pictures. Oh, this was interesting. We take some pictures farther downstream, cross stream. So this is now 15 diameters downstream, cross stream. So the, the gas is flowing through this picture. And if you looked at NO, you could kind of see the, he seeded the jet. You could see that the jet was still kind of round. But if you look at the combustion products, it, they reflect the burning front. So we learned a lot about the structure of the of the jet fluid and how it mixes and burns, you know. Okay, I think I'm a few minutes early, so we can take more time for questions. Well, so what, what I hope I've showed you is that uh, all the things that can be done with PLIF, usually with, but you have to have a species that absorbs the wavelength of light that you have. So that's the challenge. So, but NO, OH, CH, formaldehyde, are representative small molecules that can be done. You might say, well, what could we do O atoms? Do we do hydrogen atoms? Well, they're atoms. Well, the big challenge with O and H is that they're, the transition from the ground state of O and H is in, in the vacuum ultraviolet. So we can't access it. We can't access it uh, in, 
experiments conducted in, in uh, on ground. Or you might say, what about uh, CO2? Can we do CO2 combustion product? You'd like to measure a product. Hard. But we, we did find a way to measure it in the ultraviolet. Or water. So, so there's a lot of things you can't do uh, that you'd like to do. And they're kind of complementary then between absorption and, and fluorescence. So we have no trouble with water, other than it's everywhere. Water, CO2, CO. But we struggle, the absorption people struggle with radicals like OH. You have to go into, well, we go from the infrared, we go into the uh, robibronic transitions. So you want to see laser diagnostics as kind of a, like a toolbox, that there are different tools for different problems, and get a sense as to what they individually can do. And, what they're, and some of them are more quantitative than others. Uh, it's hard to measure things to 1%. Length and time are about the only things they can measure really accurately. Positions. Okay, a few questions. No questions? So, so you'd like, if, if it's a burning flow, you know, there's cold flows that, that aren't burning. If it's a burning flow, meaning temperatures are, say, how, higher than 1,000 degrees, you need, uh, you'd like a, a chemical tracer, a tracer that does not burn at high temperatures. I don't know of any. All the hydrocarbons burn. We're going to talk about hydrocarbons next time. So NO is really, so well, CO might be okay. But you have to pick, if you put NO into a combustion field, the trouble is it wants to produce more or less nitric oxide. <laughs> She's reminding me to repeat the questions. I think the question was, uh, how do you pick the tracer to do, uh, to characterize these high temperature flow fields? Low temperature flow fields we know how to do. High temperature is a problem. I think NO is the best choice. And let, maybe someone has a better idea because it's relatively inert. But if you put it into a combusting airflow at uh, 2,000 Kelvin, there will be some increased production of nitric oxide. And so that's a, a bit of a problem. But uh, at least NO, we understand the spectrum, and, and it's accessible with lasers. It's a good tracer. And then therefore, but if you then do two-line NO, that removes the need to know the amount of NO. The ratio is proportional, the numerator and the denominator, both proportional to the amount of NO. You take the ratio, it's just a temperature thing. So that's probably the very best way to measure high temperatures that I know about. If you're going to do pulse laser PLAF. If you're lower than, say, uh, 900,000 degrees, we've got a lot of tracer ideas that I'll tell you about next in the last lecture. I, and I, I went fast, I know, but you know, you've seen that it's under some conditions it's possible to measure velocity, temperature, species. I'm surprised. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. A lot of work. You'd like to have, I suppose, um, you know, you always have to, you want a snapshot. So how do you get a snapshot? The laser pulse has to be short, and the radiative decay period has to be short to go into your single-shot camera. Or you have to have a very fast camera that, re that takes an instant time. Okay, she's reminding me to, okay, Sorry. I guess they're taping this, and so some people are watching it and can't hear the questions. I'll try to remember. Uh, any other questions? 
Another question. Good. Okay. The question is, why, why are my slides so old? <laughs> That's because I'm old. So, you know, my interests have moved on. You know, what happened is a lot of people started doing PLIF, and, and uh, I, I just wanted to do something new. So we've continued to use PLIF, but I think uh, other people have carried it forward in you know, high-speed cameras, uh, uh, better data analysis. But, but frankly, the fluorescence models haven't really changed. It, it, you have to decide how you are going to interpret them and calibrate. So it's, I don't think anybody's been really successful at making quantitative, quantitative OH measurements. Pretty good progress on quantitative temperature or maybe velocity. So I think uh, what's new? Well, the, the lasers have gotten so much faster. We went from one pulse, uh, 50, 10 hertz lasers, five nanosecond pulse width. Now you can get, you can still buy that laser, which is great, or you can get a short pulse laser. So you might ask, does a shorter pulse of light help our modeling? Not really. Um, does a short pulse of light cause the light to decay faster so that you could take a, a, uh, a picture without the time delay of the fluorescence? No. So, you know, you have to find your opportunities. But, uh, but uh, there are alternatives to laser induced fluorescence based on Raman spectroscopy, where different pulse lengths could come into play. So I think the greatest progress, uh, well, there's been continual progress on the development of other laser diagnostics based upon Raman. There's a lot of people interested in short pulse Raman. So as the lasers get shorter pulses, there's some new physics involved. Can't use my simple equations anymore. So uh, we still use it, but I've just moved on to some other, I like to find something new all the time. But you know, more and more people use it. it and as you're going to see in the next lecture, there, there are applications that, uh, if, if you're interested in fluid mechanics, there's some applications that are pretty economical, pretty easy, if you use tracers. So there's a lot of interest in tracers. And we, we made progress. We went from uh, biacetyl to acetone, and suddenly everybody used acetone. But then there's uh, that's a ketone. So other acetone, uh, other ketones like uh, pentanone, C5. So they all have this certain bonding structure. And then uh, you're going to find we also use some aromatic species. So there's been some progress in, in developing better low temperature tracers. I don't know of any superior tracer for high temperature than NO. What you want is something that does not react. You can seed it into the flow field with a known mole fraction. If the mole fraction is known, it becomes easy to measure temperature. So we're kind of limited by the molecules. Cameras have gotten better, faster and faster. You can get, you can get 100 kilohertz imaging now. So the equipment has gotten, continues to get better. It's still expensive, a lot of it. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. Okay, the question is, uh, this was the, the uh, reactive, supersonic reactive flow over a, a body. And you pick a structure which is uh, 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 easy to understand, you, you know, sphere, something that has good geometry. Because the idea is to, well, your idea is either to understand the flow or to produce a data that can be used by modelers. Modelers want, a, they want high quality data of some reactive system. So what, what would go into a, a model, imagine a, a computational model of the flow over a cylinder where the flow speed is less than the detonation velocity. So what happens is the shock wave forms, then it starts to burn between the 
the body and the shock wave. And, but the speed of the, of the waves that are formed exceeds the shock. So it pushes. So you get some stream distortion of the flow fields. The modelers love that challenge. It's an unsteady problem. So that test, and what goes into that model? So uh, the chemical kinetics goes into that model. The turbulent mixing goes into that model. So it's, you're, we're always looking for flow fields that have a kind of a well-defined property that challenges the modeling, the modelers, so they can strengthen the elements of their models. I like that. I, th I like those flow fields because uh, they're uh, very accessible in our laboratory. The current interest in rotating detonating engines, that flow field is much harder to access optically. So you know you want to pick a flow field that you can study experimentally. Um, any other questions? So you might ask, well, are there? If you if you mention a species, I can. It, in order for it to fluoresce, it's got to absorb. So the way to think about can you can you do fluorescence of some species is well, does it absorb light? If it absorbs light, then it's going to emit light. Is it in a wavelength that we can access? Um, is there enough of the species that we can observe it? There's always the detection limits. Is there interference, absorption, interference emission? There's always these challenge, experimental challenges. So we're not able to... I, I, doubt if, uh, I doubt if PLIF has been used on more than five or ten species. It's interesting. Um, uh, laser diagnostics have benefited a lot from the combustion community. A lot of the money that went into the development of laser diagnostics came from the uh, combustion applications. Then they drifted off into uh, applications in fluid mechanics. So this community, the laser combustion diagnostic community, was uh, have, have mostly been the leaders in developing laser diagnostics for high temperature gases. No questions? Okay, so we'll take a short break and then we'll have the very last lecture. We have to finish by 1215. I'd like to end up on this particular subject, which is um, PLF of large, mole large molecules or tracers, because if you're studying a, a flow field, if you can put in a molecular tracer, so, you know, some people, methods you use are particles, particle imaging, velocimetry. If you, people, a lot of people don't want to put particles in their flow field. If you can put in a gaseous tracer, that's uh, good. And so can we extend planar laser reduced fluorescence to gaseous tracers? And the ones that have evolved over time have been uh, uh, large molecules. So there's history to this. Uh, and there's some physics behind it, uh, which I think, uh, so you don't even have to study combustion. You can look at fluid mechanics problems with PLAF using these tracers. So if the, the particle, if the molecule is not naturally present, if you can add it. So that's what we're going to talk about here. So the picture on the right is a temperature image, single shot cliff of acetone. So we had a flow field, basically it was a soldering iron. Soldering iron, flow coming up over the soldering iron. And we take a picture of the, of the uh, and it was, it was acetone, so it was a flow of, of air with acetone over the soldering rod in a picture of the plane. So you can see that the, the uh, lace coming in from this side was blocked, it's just a I know mean, it was probably about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit bigger. Uh, and this is the flow fields coming up, and it's heated by the, the hot rod. And here's the temperature scale. So what's impressive is to realize this is a single shot. And you look at the scale here. Pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. And so heat transfer people should say, wow, we could measure the temperature of the gaseous field around the surface. These scales are... You know, repetitive scales, but um, these these scales right here are, are shown. So basically, if you look at this, you realize that we're talking about we're able to resolve 
mold temperatures. So that should get your attention if you're a heat transfer person. Uh, this might be useful in, in uh, testing heat transfer to some body. We're going to talk about acetone because it turns out to be a really good flow tracer. Acetone, you know, it's a, I think it has a vapor pressure about 180 torr. We use it for cleaning everything. It's not hazardous. It's easy to use. <coughs> High vapor pressure, pretty easy to, to use and experiment. It is hydrocarbon, therefore it burns. So if you heat it to in air, to say 800 Kelvin or so, it'll burn in a few milliseconds. So you have to kind of find if, if it's going to uh, be compatible with your particular experiment. The extension to pentanone is kind of a trivial one. Uh, I'm going to show you some stuff in IC engines. I'm always, I'm always interested in CW strategies. Then I'm going to talk about toluene, and then I'll talk about the future. So Cliff started with uh, OH. Actually, we, start, we did actually we did sodium atoms before we did OH uh, in, in Cliff, but we reported this. Um, result, my student, George Kitschkoff. Uh, Rob Howe was my technician. He got so interested in research, he then got his PhD at Stanford and with another professor. He's now a professor at Harvard. That's kind of a nice story. Um, anybody here from Virginia? Jim McDaniel was my postdoc in Virginia. Okay. Think about... Um, Planar loose fluorescence is you have to have absorption followed by emission. Remember how we talked about um, small molecules have discrete spectra of big molecules that we think about features. Similarly, when you go from LIF of small molecules to, to uh, big particles, we have to kind of rethink our, our models. Uh, always way to think about this, I always like to think about this as a the signal that you get is photons in, photons, fraction absorbed, fraction that are re-emitted, fraction that you collect. If you think about it that way, it's uh, pretty simple. Okay, so there's a lot of interest in, uh, in studying um, airflows, but it's hard to study oxygen and nitrogen by spectroscopic methods. So I told you that we had... Uh, I see the what's uh, this molecule right here. And it has this, uh, it's smelly. It's, uh, it smells just like the, in fact, I think it's used as a flavoring in popcorn. So this is it's this double bond right here in this molecule that's responsible for this desirable fluorescence properties. So whether it uh, has a methyl out here or it has a, a larger, um, this is three. This is a uh, uh, acetyl. It's two of the, two acetyls together. Uh, there are other molecules that have this double bond. They all have the desirable flow, uh, fluorescence properties. It was my student Lozano, who's uh, Spanish, uh, that uh, discovered this in the early 1990s uh, because we couldn't do biacetyl anymore, and it turns out to be really nice. So uh, now we're talking about big molecules that have uh, uh, broad features rather than lines. So now here's the absorption in nanometers of, uh, of this uh, acetone. It absorbs around 225 nanom nanometers up to about here. So it absorbs in the blue and emits in the red. Oh, that's a desirable quality. You send light in, it's absorbed in the blue, comes back at you in the red. So it's not going to be interfered with by <coughs> scattering from the blue. So uh, that's a property of, of large hydrocarbons. But that means you want to have a laser that works at shorter wavelengths to do this. The advantage of ketones, strong signals, non-resonant non -resonant fluorescence. That means the fluorescence comes back at you in a different color. So if you've got a camera, it doesn't see the laser. It only sees the fluorescence. Acetone is a really nice property. It's... Uh, safe, and it's similar to fuel. So the combustion people like this because you can imagine 
acetone being added into their engine experiment, and it acts kind of like the native hydrocarbon. If you're in an isothermal isobaric flow, it's really simple because the uh, fluorescence yield doesn't change. It's when pressure changes and uh, temperature changes that there's a challenge. Okay, so we have to have a new diagram. <laughs> the diagram now is that you have a ground state of this molecule. And it's a big molecule. So it's like a, a cloud of energy levels together. We don't really think about the state anymore, but you can think about a state right now. So there's some state within this manifold, and this is in the electronic ground state, and it's going to absorb light into the excited state. S stands for, S stands for singlet. It just means the spin is zero. So it's a molecule which, for which the ground state has zero spin, and it's a big molecule with lots of modes. So it's just a, a sea of modes. But if you send in at one wavelength, it'll get absorbed up here in another cloud. And once it's up there, a lot of things can happen. Remember, the fluorescence yield has to do with where it is, what happens after it's absorbed. It can fluoresce, which means it goes back down by light. Or it can transfer. It can transfer within this cloud or it can transfer to another state. Someone uh, you asked about uh, phosphorescence. So you can transfer over to this other state, which is a triplet with a T, which means that it's, uh, it spins one. Once it gets there, its decay path is by phosphorescence. So fluorescence is short-lived radiation. <coughs> phosphorescence is long-lived. And so you probably, when you're young, you get exposed to, well, phosphorescence with the TV tubes or whatever. You, you see phosphorus. You, get it lit up and go in the closet, and you can see it come back at you slowly. It's a phosphor. So those are the kind of the key first steps in the, in the, in the physics of this process. So it's a desirable property because it's cheap, non-toxic, safe. The uh, lifetime, the radiative lifetime up here is two nanoseconds. So that says if you went up here and nothing else happened, it's coming back in two nanoseconds. Of course, other things can happen. So that means it's going to be fast. The big molecules is fast. You have to, it has to be fast if you're going to study a, a high-speed flow. So what we want to know is the fluorescence uh, quantum yield. The A coefficient over the sum of Qs. We don't yet know what Q is. But it turns out that if you take a sample of, of uh, acetone and you look at the fluorescence yield, which is nothing more than the photons you get back, it's about 0.2%. That's one in 500. That's a lot better than it was for the species we talked about earlier, which was A over Q. A was, say, 10 to the 6. Q is 10 to the 10. 10 to the minus 4. So fluorescence yields might be 10 to the minus 4, say. This fluorescence yield is a lot better, a couple of times 0.2%. Uh, you know, but all of a sudden, this is looking good. Send in some light, a lot comes back. And we know that it's safe to handle, got a high vapor pressure. It's going to be nice. But we have to understand it better. Uh, if you were just doing an experiment at room temperature, fluorescence yield would be a constant, not a problem. And we do that, actually. But if you go to a flow field, Actually, a long story about how the people in Germany and England and the U.S. were studying acetone together, and they were disagreeing. I get a different fluorescence yield. Why? Well, this, we're using different wavelengths, but the point is that the understanding of fluorescence yield in, in uh, acetone uh, took a while to get sorted out. So it absorbs down there at around 270 nanometers. Now, someone was asking about uh, how you deal with the fact that uh, your camera has wavelength sensitivity. You run into this problem. There's the acetone uh, spectrum. If you use a uh, camera that's not wavelength corrected, so you have to pay attention to the the response of your camera as a function of wavelength. It's not always a constant, so you have to pay attention to stuff like that. 
All right. This is how good it is. Uh, Mongo and I had a student, uh, Scott Smith, and he wanted to study jet and cross flow. Jet and cross flow. So here's this jet. Here's a flow of air. This is a room temperature experiment. Very simple. Isobaric, room temperature, jet into cross flow. Cross flow is uh, five meters per second coming this way. Uh, diameter of the jet was about five millimeters. And so there's basically uh, an air jet with some acetone in it. So this is the image that you see on the visible camp. So the camera, high quality scientific camera, visible emission at about five or 600 nanometers, no intensifier. And this is what you see. You see it with your eye. It's a single shot image. And if you're a fluids person, you look down there and say, wow, look at this. My ability to resolve over a wide dynamic range, the mixing, the only thing you're seeing is the mixing of the acetone. It all starts here, it all starts here, and over time, it's way down here. The fluids people had never seen that before, because if you calculate, they can't calculate this. If it were, if it were, um, uh, textbook, you might think of it as some sort of Gaussian distribution. But, so you can take instantaneous images here and here and all over the place. So you can begin to see the structure, the real structure of a room temperature jet. So in the limit, this isothermal and isobaric, the quantum yield's a constant. And if the quantum yield's a constant, it's, an, it's just a measure of the mole fraction. So this is the mixing of the jet. Life is good when you're at the constant temperature and pressure. And he took pictures of all different kinds. They were really intrigued by, take this picture here, looking at it as it's coming towards you. Look at this. Here's the, here's the jet coming down. It's like a gal, kind of like a uh, circle. Look at this trailing thing down here. I don't think they expected to see this at all. So you can begin to see the power of tracer-based PLAF for fluid mechanics. Important test for fluid mechanics. But if you go back and look at this equation again, you have to look in here. Now I'm going to write the absorption cross-section and the fluorescence yield. Everything else is kind of no. This is the physics is here. And the, and the cross-section for absorption depends on wavelength and temperature. And for big molecule, it doesn't depend on pressure. Fluorescence yield depends on wavelength, temperature, and pressure. So that's the photophysical parameters. In that case I just showed you, it was isothermal and isobaric. They're constants. We're done. But we stumbled on this problem when people started studying compressible flows where the pressure was not constant. So it, eventually we developed this model. Uh, I think I had two students over this time. We developed this model, and I had a visiting postdoc from Germany. So now you go down and you think about this. Here's the, here's the lower manifold, S0 it's called, singlet, zero spin, zero. The first excited state is up here. It's a cloud of energy levels. So you send in a laser of some wavelength of energy that takes you up to here. We don't pay attention to what quantum state that is. We don't even think about that quantum state. It's just an energy. And it would be the average, if you think about the average energy, that it's probably occurring from the thermally averaged energy. It goes up here. And what happens? It can fluoresce from there. It can have a vibrational transfer down to here by an amount called delta E collision. Or it can cross over to this other electronic system. That's called a lot of detail for you. That's called inter-system crossing or internal conversion. That rate depends a little bit on oxygen concentration. And uh, we learned slowly <laughs> that these rates depended upon energy. So we had to put together a new model uh, for the fluorescence yield. And the fluorescence yield would be A, K sub F is the fluorescence rate, K sub F. Average over all energies. 
So he, he, this is always the sum of the removal. It's always the sum of the removal terms. So you had the sum over energy. This is the probability of having some value of energy. I'm not going to go into this in great detail. So the point is the, you had to recognize, and this was what was hard, that uh, in a short time there could be a collision that changes the vibrational energy down. And so the physical chemists, if they're in here, will know that you talk about this in terms of delta E down. Already we have a new parameter. There's the rate of going over to the other system depending on energy, and we didn't know how it depended on energy. There's the role of oxygen, and we didn't understand the role of that. So there's a lot of unknowns when you started looking closer at this problem that's not isothermal and isobaric. In our, in our model, there are four parameters that we had to infer. So you have to do experiments to infer the parameters in the model. And then you have a model that you can use to interpret the quantum yield of a, in any application. So this is where we got into trouble with our friends in Germany and, and uh, in Britain. So if you go in and you measure the uh, fluorescent signal at different temperatures, Look at the, kind of the relative amount of fluorescence you get back. With this pentanone is kind of is just like acetone, except there's one more methyl on the east side. If you look at this, all of a sudden, wow, the fluorescent signal depends a lot on the excitation wavelength. And that's when we got into trouble. Some people were using, I think we were using 308. And Germans were using, so everyone's complaining we don't get the same answer. Well, it was because we weren't using the same laser. So the, exit, so the fluorescence yield depends upon the absorption wavelength. Fine, so we figured that out. Now you want to ask, uh, well, since it depends upon wavelength, maybe the thing to do is to measure temperature using the wavelength, the uh, temperature dependence of this. So we went in and we said, what if you use a combination, two colors, two lasers? What if you use uh, three weight, 248, or three? These are numbers that correspond to convenient X and laser wavelengths. So it turns out that you can measure, if you take a double pulse, take the fluorescence signal, take the ratio, it's incredibly temperature sensitive if you, don't, if you want it or you don't want it. So this is a pentanone up here, acetone down here. Look at this. If you use three pentanone and these two colors, this is amazingly temperature sensitive. So if you want to measure temperature in that temperature range, what a, t what a great idea this is. So you either have to want temperature sensitivity or not want temperature sensitivity, but, but temperature is very temperature sensitive. So all that means is that uh, while the acetone signals I showed you for isothermal isobaric were easy, not so easy when temperature and pressure are varying. So my student... Uh, did an experiment with uh, 266, that's a quadrupled YAG laser, N32 YAG laser quadrupled. <laughs> Here's a xenon chloride laser, acrylic mirror, 50 millijoules, they go in, bang, bang, to this flow field. John Cook is the student. And so now that we have two colors, two colors, it's isobaric, you can use the ratio to get temperature, and then either one of them to get the concentration. So all of a sudden we realized we knew, we knew how to make this quantitative. Instantaneous temperature and mole fraction images from a heated jet. And it's, it's quite easy. It's quite good. It takes two lasers, one camera. Using one camera is kind of nice because uh, you don't have to worry about camera-to-camera -camera variations. I put in some engine stuff here. Someone here is, uh, worked for Dave Rothamer. I hope he's here on here. Okay, um, one of my students at uh, Wisconsin. So you can use this in an engine uh, to look at the temperature inside an engine. This is called uh, a bow dish configuration. So you can bring the laser light in here, across a quartz opening, and then the fluorescence is at right angles, comes down, and the piston's going up and down, but this thing stays fixed and the light comes out here. It's called a bow ditch configuration. So you can do uh, engine imaging in an engine. 
and there's a, now we've got a lot of choices. Well, what tracer shall we use? What wavelength shall we use? How do we interpret the signals? There's a lot of possibilities. It turns out that acetone and pentanone are good because they happen to have vapor pressure curves similar to gasoline. So the idea is you think you can you, uh, get something that doesn't, uh, is similar to what gasoline is doing. It's a tracer of gasoline. Now, I mentioned oxygen. Some tracers are very sensitive to oxygen. Fortunately, acetone and pentanone are not. So some tracers that are really good, you can't use them with oxygen. So I don't want to go too long today. So uh, these are images, single shot images of temperature up here at different crank angles and mole fraction images. So the point is they could look inside an engine and watch the mixing and watch the temperature. They were really interested in uh, uh, EGR, exhaust gas recirculation, in the, at the Combustion Research Facility, Livermore, California. That was Jordan Snyder, actually. That one was Jordan Snyder. He's at uh, Pratt & Whitney. So excimer lasers, fluorescence, powerful way to, and a tracer, a tracer. So this only works, uh, what's its highest temperature? 600 degrees. You cannot use this tracer higher than, say, 700 or 800 degrees Kelvin. And so you, he, they could look at mixing and test their engine models, engine stratification. They were worried about EGR and uh, how, how well uniform things were. I think these are some more kind of similar things. Okay, he got it eventually. After this took three years. Eventually, he could measure temperature with up to, down to about four or five degree uh, differences in temperature. He could resolve temperature to about, about uh, five degrees. And you can look and see a kind of... Uh, spotting cold spots and so your, your mental picture what's happening in the engine and the motion of the gases and the temperature change so even though there's some you have to understand the photophysics if you pick the right tracers and the right conditions uh, it's not that it's 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 okay they could attribute these uh, temperature things to heat transfer to the surfaces and so on okay Okay, so most people use pulse lasers. And now over the last several years, we have uh, high-speed pulse lasers, burst mode lasers, but they're very expensive. I've always been interested in the idea of using continuous lasers. So now we, here's a case where we have a, a, a continuous wave. This would be a frequency, probably a uh, 532... Probably a frequency doubled YAG laser, five watts. Frequency doubled down to 266 nanometers, which is a wavelength which can be um, absorbed by toluene. Toluene is another, it's like a, an aromatic. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a benzene with a methyl off to the side. It's a different molecular structure. It turns out that it's a very good temperature sensor, as long as there's no oxygen around. Anyway, the idea is we would take a continuous wave laser, form it into a sheet down to about 250 milliwatts. And now the idea is if the sheet is continuous, I can take high speed movies of any speed I want. I no longer am limited to single shot or, or, or an expensive laser. But I do not have a lot of photons. I don't have a lot of photons. I'm taking advantage of the high fluorescence yield of toluene. And the easy, easy accessible wavelength of 266 nanometers. I don't need any tunability. And uh, I wanted to, the student asked the question, how well could he do? What is the minimum fluctuation he could uh, resolve in his small experiment? And of course, it depends upon the uh, size of the region he's imaging. Looks like he looked at regions as small as 50 microns by 50 microns. So these points here correspond to what, what he can do 
with 50 micron, which is small, 50 micron resolution as a function of laser power. So more laser power is good. So what this means is that he could resolve 3% fluctuations in the toluene mole fraction. That's not real good. But if he went down to, um, if, he, if he took average, uh, averages of, say, 100 microsecond images, and he had a 200 milliwatts, and he was willing to image 400 microns by 400 microns, 0.4 millimeters, he could resolve 1% changes in the mole fraction. So that's pretty good for fluid mechanics study. So that's, uh, as far as I know, nobody else ever worries about doing CW fluorescence but, but me. I like it. it can, we can't compete with uh, the burst mode laser people in terms of uh, laser power. But we, this is a very cheap, simple experiment. And he demonstrated this. So he had a, this was a, this looks like a downward, this is a jet must be coming downward, downward jet. Here's a single shot image of his toluene fluorescence. This is toluene and, and nitrogen, so it's a mixing problem again. This is what happens if he averages images. And this was the difference. So you can kind of, he could, de he could characterize this detection sensitivity and what small, how small the fluctuations could he observe. So I think this is still a good idea. I think if you had a higher power laser, intent, I had just a fairly cheap laser frequency, I think the concept is still a good one. Um, high speed imaging. All right. What am I up to now? Back to that same equation. So toluene, I want to kind of talk about toluene a little bit. Toluene is an interesting idea. Uh, there's a critical need for good tracers to work at uh, uh, in gas dynamic flows where there's, where there's uh, interesting questions. So I had a student, he's a professor in New York somewhere, toluene based, so we, we took a shock tube, which is usually round, and we converted it into a square shock tube for the last 10 feet or so. And on the end of the shock tube, we put windows on three sides. So we could kind of look in and look at the gas dynamics of the shockwave propagation and reflection and the boundary layer behavior near walls. And we're going to use toluene because of this very good properties of temperature sensing. But remember, toluene doesn't like oxygen, so you have to do your experiments in nitrogen. That's the downside of toluene. But it's very temperature sensitive. So here's his arrangement. He, he would have a pulse. In this case, he used a, a pulsed... Um, uh, pulse laser. We, we do have a 266 laser that will go up to about 50 kilohertz. So you can actually get a high repetition rate uh, Exmer laser. And so we send it through this the horizontal sheet above the, wa the wall. I mean, we can send in the sheet in any direction. And now we look, we looked first to see how well is this behaving. So this is a picture of the, here's the end wall. Here's the incident shock was coming. Uh, I got my coordinates wrong. End wall here, incident shock. Okay, so here's what we're seeing is the uh, the uh, temperature distribution when the shock wave is here. So gas is at one temperature on one side and another temperature on the other side, and you can ask how well it works. So we use that to calibrate, not to calibrate, to make sure we knew what we we're doing. So now we're finally to pictures. So this is the case of a. The reflected shock bifurcation is a classic problem. <laughs> shock wave comes down the tube and goes back. Here's the sidewall. And there's a bound, incident shock boundary layer right here. Reflected shock is coming back and it's interacting by this bifurcation right here. Here's some heat transfer on the end wall. So this was an instantaneous image that let us interrogate the gas dynamics of this particular very important flow field. We could get really beautiful pictures of now. What is the signal? Signal depends. Upon, we're back to the fluorescence model. The signal depends upon the, the density of the de it's, it's uniformly mixed. It's not a mixing problem. It's a it's a gas dynamics problem. It depends on the number the uh, number density of toluene and the quantum yield. 
So the trouble is it depends upon not the mole fracture. It depends on temperature and pressure. So that's a bit of a complication. So we had to kind of, we had to try to compare it with computations, which we did, experiment computation. So the code is called Charles. It's a Stanford code. So basically we could look and see that the turbulent uh, capabilities of the code are pretty consistent with our experiments. How would that, this experiment couldn't have been done before. It would have been done by uh, uh, moxeter interferometry or Schlier intershadograph. But now this is an instantaneous cut in the flow field. So hopefully you can see the, the benefits of this. Oh, I'm back to my, uh, I'm back to my uh, uh, wedge problem here. So the flow over a wedge is always very interesting because you can use it for calibrating a hypersonic flow facility. All right, now what I want to talk about is the trade off, how you can do temperature. I think somebody asked me a question kind of like this. So if you have a fluorescence spectrum, oops, if you have a fluorescence spectrum, the question is what's the temperature, what's the spectral distribution with temperature, how does it change? So this is a plot, really, of, um, of, of the fluorescent spectrum. Remember I told you that uh, in fluorescence you can have a excitation spectrum or fluorescent spectrum. Fluorescent spectrum, if you send a light at one color and you watch the spectral distribution of the light that comes back out, that depends upon temperature. So if we understood this, well, or if we just character measured it, uh, now this is a better picture. This is the spectral distribution and different temperatures. So what you see is that it changes with temperature, and that gives you the idea of why don't we just use two filters? Why don't we use a filter that captures the fluorescence from here and one that captures this over here? This is very temperature sensitive. And so the ratio of the fluorescence images uh, get rid of all of the problems we've got with the modeling and will be very temperature sensitive. That was. Uh, it was a collaboration with Germans. So we're taking, so toluene is a really, if you want to go away with some ideas for, for tracers, toluene is a good one if you don't have any oxygen. Uh, acetone, pentanone are good ones if you, they're insensitive to oxygen. So we just take, we just uh, use some, capture some, uh, basically you capture the light and you put it through two filters. And you then take the ratio of the intensities. So you have to have two, two cameras. And this turns out to be pretty good. Function of temperature. This ratio. Ratio is a function of temperature. So this worked. We did it out to 900 Kelvin. Three demonstrations. So we did this. Uh, we also did this uh, in the uh, expansion tunnel. So here's our our wedge problem again. So the, here's the flow over the wedge. Here's the wedge. Here's the flow. Here's the shock wave. So we're just looking along this line here, showing you the results along this line uh, to see the temperature. So we was able to measure the temperature here. To This is the noise. So you can see the temperature jump. So a single shot, supersonic flow uh, over a wedge. This is back to my uh, blended cylinder again. You can do this. It wasn't quite as good. It wasn't quite as good. Back to that uh, jet and cross flow problem. And now, we, now we're instantaneous imaging of temperature, using, now using toluene. I showed you some earlier results with, uh, with OH and NO, but this is, uh, this is toluene. So it's amazingly good. As long as you don't have oxygen, because it's a molecular tracer, as long as you don't have oxygen, and as long as the temperatures are not so high to cause it to decompose. So I'm getting close to the end. I think this is the next to the last slide. So you might ask, uh, what's the future? Somebody asked a little bit about the future. What's the future of PLF imaging? I think we'll, just, we'll see it improve, but we'll also see it used. Uh, it's, it's great for looking at some gas dynamics problems like the non-ideal effects in shock tubes, engines, scramjets, fluid dynamics, plasma-enhanced combustion, 
So it's, it, you have to pick a, you have to have a, a naturally present species or a tracer that's compatible with your particular problem. But if it's a non-reactive problem, we have, a, we have some good choices for tracers. Some emerging strategies are higher speeds, multi-parameters, infrared. There's just a lot of possibilities. So this is my last slide. So I'm, what I'm hoping that is you've at least gone away, or hope you'll go away thinking that laser diagnostics is a good field. It's a good tool. It's going to continue. It's, it's uh, evolving with time. It's going to become easier because of the availability of package systems. I'm particularly attracted to dire, tunable diode lasers. I think uh, we've seen this in the last 10 years. The, the, the growth in the number of people doing this is unbelievable. Unbelievable. When I went to China maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, virtually nobody doing tunable diode lasers. I'll bet there's 100 groups in China or more doing tunable diode lasers now because it's, 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 it's easy. It's powerful. It's economical. But if you want spatial resolution, you, you, you've got it. You don't have many choices. And uh, LIF or PLIF is uh, are among the choices. Alternative would be cars, coherent anti-stokes, Robin spectroscopy of different types, much harder. So I think we'll, we'll see more of, um, of LIF and PLIF. And I think we'll see more and more routine use of LIF. More and more people just, just use them without thinking. We got thermocouples, pressure gauges. Pretty soon you'll have uh, laser. Uh, techniques or sensors. The difference between diagnostics and sensors to me is, well, now we're starting to use it. It's not, a, a, not an exploration thing. We're actually using the sensor. And so we're going to see this in, um, in complicated situations, you know, process control, uh, laboratory research, shock tubes and lasers. I think there's no doubt about it. So to me, I'm really, I'm really an optimist about the future. So this is my, my last line. I hope you don't mind my old-fashioned humor. Uh, I think laser diagnostics are great. You, you can heat transfer, astrophysics, combustion. You know, combustion is just energy conversion. So, so whether it's hydrogen or whatever, ammonia or whatever, the fuel, you can still use the same tools. So whether it's uh, sensing of a household burner, there are always questions about uh, emissions and uh, performance of, of, that you can address with, that you need to address with optical techniques that you're, are best addressed with an optical technique. Maybe because of its speed or sensitivity or, you know, you, hand, you now have handhold uh, methane monitor. You go around and, or, you know, or walk off the wall. So it just gets better and better and better. And the physics is not all that complicated. So I think it's a good thing to work on. I think there's a future. The applications will be different for all of you, but at least you'll go away having some sense maybe of the potential. I'm not sure how to what to make of the fact that we have fewer people here than we started with, but the, anyway, I hope you appreciated the course and I thank you for coming. So when I started, as a, so I did my PhD research a long time ago using a pressure gauge to study chemistry. It did take me long to realize, what is this new stuff about lasers that I need to learn about? So I kind of caught the wave. And of course, the wave has passed me now, passed me up. A lot of young people doing more modern things. But, uh, so you're lucky if in your career you kind of, if you're a researcher, if you kind of catch the early part of some new evolution, revolution. Always lucky. And it's continuing, fortunately, for me. Good. Well, any of you are welcome to contact me by email or, or personally and, and uh, answer any questions you have. Sorry, if I, I didn't organize, organize myself very well for these lectures, I'm afraid. A lot of, uh, but you've got all the material. You just have to study it on your own. Yeah, questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can I comment on collecting tracers? Sure. Because, so again, if it's a non-reacting flow, flow field you want to study or heat transfer, 
it's really simple. Things like toluene or, or, or acetone or, or uh, well, acetone. It, you don't care if there's oxygen around. You can use it in the air. It's safe. It's got a high vapor pressure because you need the vapor. So it's like incredibly good. And on the other hand, if you're trying to measure, if you, if you want to measure a qu particular quantity, if you want to measure mole fraction, mixture, mixing is one thing. If you want to measure transfer, you might change the wavelengths it used. But the, con but the tracer itself, it's hard to beat. After all these years, it's hard to beat acetone. Or if you want high temperature sensitivity and you don't have oxygen around, toluene. And you can go, oh, okay, maybe you don't want toluene. You want another aromatic. But certain molecular structures have the same quantum yield behavior. So remember, it's all back to the quantum yield, A over Q. Um, yeah, those are, those are two great tracers. Remember, they're, they're molecular. There's no particles. And the, and the people are not going to complain if you put a little acetone vapor in your experiment. They don't want you to put nitric oxide. If it's burning, however, if it's a, if it's a high temperature problem, above 1,000 Kelvin in, with oxygen around, you can't use these, these tracers. They're reactive. So we lack, to my knowledge, we lack a good high temperature non-reactive tracer. NO is the best we got, but NO is a bit reactive. You put it in a high temperature air, it's for, it, there's, NO is being formed and removed, and so it's not, it's not a constant. Uh, those would be my recommendations, acetone, pen, uh, uh, toluene, and uh, uh, NO. But people don't like NO. A lot of people don't, they want, don't want you to put NO in their tunnels. Well, that's the problem, it's toxic. You can go to some other, there's some other things, NO2, toxic. A lot of the really good ones, really good A over Q, are nasty. Can't use them. Yes? I was asking, how the Russian, what area Russian changed use when we do that? Is that a different Yeah, I didn't get the question. Something about what is the influence of pressure? Yes, yes, yeah. So what's the influence of pressure in laser diagnostics? Well, uh, it's, uh, you know, if you have, if you have um, incompressible flows, means the pressure is not really changing. It, it may be high. And so higher pressure is always harder. It broadens the lines. You know, it's a, it's a factor. But if it's fairly constant, we can deal with that. It, in the, for, remember, we have small molecules and big molecules. For small molecules, pressure broadens the lines, changes the absorption. Um, big molecules, like uh, octane, say, pressure doesn't have any effect on the absorption. So uh, pressure is, you have to consider it. But the hardest problem of all is when the pressure, when you have a compressible flow field with variable pressure. Like if you ask, what are some interesting challenges for the future? I'll tell you, find a way to measure pressure at a point in a, in a hypersonic flow field. Nobody knows how to do that yet. I'm pretty sure, well, I have my idea, but it's not working yet. So pressure is, is, is important, but if in your problem is constant, you can deal with it. It's when it's, but higher pressure is harder. Well, it's harder to do the experiments. It's easy to do experiments when they're in the open. So pressure is a, is a factor and you have to consider it, but it's not always an enemy. Uh, sometimes it's the goal and we measure pressure. So we measure pressure in some experiments. We measure pressure by looking at the shape of lines. We can measure pressure in a, in a compressible flow field. So pressure is an important parameter. Temperature and pressure are really important. But if you're lucky, if one of, or both of them are constant, life gets pretty simple. Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, imagine a sooting burner, sooting flame burner. Light comes through. Some of it's absorbed by mo molecules, and some of it's scattered by particles. Yeah, so it, it attenuates, it affects the signal. But 
you have to decide what you want. If you, if you only care about the molecular absorption, you, you deal with that more in my scanned DA method, Get on and off the line. The soot is everywhere, but the molecular absorption can be distinguished by scanning on and off the line. That's if you want the, the, the uh, gas. If you want the particles, well, then, you have, then you measure the atten you, you turn away from the molecular absorption and you look at the attenuation of the beam due to the particles only. And we do that. We measure the soot formation and the shock tube by looking at the extinction of light. So yeah, particles are an issue. It's, it's a problem and it's an opportunity. I think I heard two questions. Uh, the first one had to do with if I take uh, uh, ratios of signals to get temperature. Uh, notice that we do that for a single species so that the signal, which is proportional to the concentration of the species and the Boltzmann fraction and maybe the quantum yield, but I do that in denominator, the species constant goes away. So you measure temperature by taking the ratio of signals from two quantum states of the same molecule. Then it only depends upon Boltzmann fraction. Okay. Second one had to do, your second question, I think, had to do with uh, the square cross-section that I showed you. Did we do it on purpose? Yes, because uh, it's easier to look inside something if you have flat windows. If you have a round chamber, it's pretty hard to look in. Now, I didn't show you today, but one of my students has just done something really amazing. So we take a round shock tube. So in that case, I showed you, we had a square shock tube. So we can send in light through a window and we can look. I should have said, he made um, measurements in a plane within 60 microns of the surface. That, that was impressive. The study of the flows that I showed you. Yeah, we did that on purpose. But I now have a student who has assembled custom optics for a, a, a shock tube, a five-inch diameter shock tube, where the windows are not, where they're, uh, Inner, inner contour fits the shock tube, but it's segmented in two optical pieces of glass in, with certain shape so that a parallel beam comes in is also a parallel beam. So you, but that's a problem. Doing optical measurements in a round experiment is a problem. You have to get the light in through a window. And if the window's curved, you've got to think about this. So yeah, we did that on purpose. Yes. Going back to my question about the studying. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Do you think there's like some way of uh, finding out what's the difference? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the question was, you know, I was talking about, he, he asked something like, and I'm, I may have said three, anyway, how many molecules does it take in a box that to, to say pressure is, is meaningful? If you have two molecules bouncing around in a box, we, we don't think about pressure. We think about two things bouncing around in there. On the other hand, we know that if there's a chamber, we have to measure pressure. And if you had kinetic theory, you know, we, we evaluate this with, uh, with collisions. But we always think about uh, a large number of particles. Now, but um, individual atoms or molecules do absorb light. So you could study if you had sufficient sensitivity, you could imagine, you could imagine. What if they're only moving, uh, uh, maybe it's, uh, there's uh, just one axis. Okay, you could look, I think, along that axis and you could see the Doppler shift at absorption. You could measure the, the, the signal from every atom or molecule. And then you could add them all up and, and, and see when it starts behaving like pressure. I have a feeling that it's, uh, and it's just, a, it's probably a well-defined problem. How many particles do we have to have bouncing around in the box? You could do this, you could probably do this like a homework assignment. Individual particles bouncing in a box. At what point does pressure somehow have some meaning? I'm, I'm guessing hundreds or thousands. I told you that I had a colleague and we did an experiment. I did the experiment. 
he did a simulation of the shock reflection from the surface. And in his uh, molecular, direct molecular simulations, he just had hard particles. He only had 5,000 particles, limited by the size of his computer. Nowadays, they'd probably use, you know, 200,000 or something. But he found we had physical parameters when he happened to use. He used the most he could, which is 5,000. Already we had it. So somewhere a lot less than that is enough, I think. But that's a really interesting question. I'm going to save that question for some PhD student. But if you put a pressure gauge on the wall, put a pressure gauge, because that's what pressure is. It's, it's force on the surface. Put a pressure gauge on the wall, one centimeter or one centimeter, in, in a one centimeter by one centimeter box. Put it, okay, pressure. It's something that responds to force. Ultimate high sensitivity. Put in 10 particles, put in five particles. Bang, 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 bang. You feel it. At some point, it would be a steady, it would be a steady force. I think that's one way to define it. At what point would the impact of these particles look like a steady number? That's how I define pressure. Yeah, that's, that's a good, but it's a really good question. But if you remember what pressure is, it's force on the surface. So imagine an ideal pressure sensor that responded to every impact of a molecule coming in and bouncing off. Bang, bang. Because you have conservation of mass and momentum. Mass is conserved, momentum. So it comes in and has to go back out, say, by speculating. So just ask, well, what would it look like if I had a one square centimeter and I put in so many? And the number you put in and their average, say, speed would tell you what, how often you're getting these pulses. And once you start getting enough of them, it looks steady. I got pressure. I think that's, that's a great question, a really good question. You know, people do, uh, you've heard of uh, optical tweezers, and, and, and you've probably heard of how you can cool atoms down to your molecules down to, you know, amazingly low temperature, you know, 10 to the minus 3 Kelvin or something. You know, so there's, there's a lot of ways you can look at individual atoms. They can put them in place, and they just don't move. You start to move, and you push. So there's a lot of things that occur at a, just a few atoms or molecules, really interesting things. But, you know, we're kind of combustion, atmospheric pressure, Stuff. So we have the advantage of the statistics of large numbers. Statistical mechanics is all about large numbers. There is a most somebody was asking me about this last night. You know, we think that uh, there's a very specific uh, entropy, but the fact is, is if you can get absolutely instantaneous snapshot of the particles of some region, there's some fluctuations going on. Is it? You know, because it's, it's the fact that we have so many particles that we can say that there is a most probable number and that it's, it is what it is. But the fact is, it's not exactly constant. Now, if you have a small enough sample of particles, you start seeing it. And it's kind of like your pressure question. You start, when I start lowering the number, uh -huh, when does pressure go away? And I think you can say the same thing to the theorists. The people who really know thermodynamics to ask these questions about the theory of thermodynamics. And, and you've maybe heard of Maxwell, dis Maxwell demons. And the, there's these special cases that, that have driven, driven these theorists crazy about what does this mean in thermodynamics. But, but, but as soon as you get back to uh, large numbers, then there is, a, there is a most probable number. But there's actually, in reality, there's a variation with time of numbers. Very interesting. Yeah, that, that question is really a good one. I, if I turn it around, at what point does the density get so low that I can't define pressure well? And what I see, I think, on the surface is fluctuations in, in force. Yeah, good. Any other questions? Well, I need to let you go to lunch, and I want to thank you again for coming. And uh, I hope that if you have any questions, contact me. I hope that uh, and if you find any mistakes in my notes, holler. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.